Well, welcome to today's stream, part two. We're going to be reading some... Hello DM, have a nice stream. Thank you very much for four months. We're going to be a little bit quieter today. A little bit quieter tonight. We're going to be reading some spooky stories that are in public domain. That is the main plan for tonight. So we'll be talking quietly. And I am recording this now. So this stream will be available on YouTube later. For you to listen into if you can't get all of it today, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Heck and hydrate, thank you, Shosui. And heck and choose for you, faulty lamp. I am going to turn off some of the redeems, uh, just so that we can keep up the flow of the flow of the stream. That's the main thing. There we go. Okay. That. Ha ha. <laughs> we have some of them turned off, okay? Maybe wise to turn down the alerts. Unfortunately, I can't control the individual here. Check and I know they're a bit. I know they're a bit loud. Oh, this knee is. If thank you very much for 14 months and also nine the nine thanks for gift sub and Kogaku thank you for the sub and Pilot thank you very much for sub and Cephalo thank you for the sub Captain Mika thank you for the sub Perix thank you Pickaxe Ron Chosui there's too many of you ha. <laughs> and Nyan Nyan for you Gratorian. Read them with M4 on. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Probably won't be able to stay. I lose service on my trip home. Oh no! Wait a minute. Are some of. I had. Okay, I think I have to turn off those ones. There we go. There we go. I'll turn off the ASMR, please, because we are on. We're on ASMR today. There we go. Fixing some of the settings before we get started. Soft type train. A soft type train. Very soft, very quiet. That one did. Thank you. Let me pause redeems. That way mods get well. Too late for that, Azora. Too late. Mm -mm. Too late. I'll just have to manually turn them on later. Manually turn them on later. Yep, yeah, man. Thank you for the gift subs. The key jet. Thank you for the sub. It's too late for you. It's story time. Yes. Um, let me make sure I have everything set up here so we can see it. And I know the I know the alerts are a bit loud, so I think what I have to do is go here and fix this. Hi, quiet, quiet, quiet hyping, quiet hyping. I'm gonna adjust the alerts so that they're not quite as loud um, as they currently are. So let's see. Here, and that to play Lavender Town, right? You need a PC to stream. Uh, you can find lots of information about mobile streaming if you look on YouTube. Alert variations, I think, is the one. This, this one needs. Well, Yawas, thank you for the gift subs. I think it won't, and it won't actually do the the lowered volume sound of the the subs until later. Turned all that down. Thank you for the bits. <laughs> I think the bits should still be pretty quiet. And malicious, thank you for the sub as well. Oh my gosh, Rod, I'm also for level five. Thank you, and Scruffy, thanks for that hydrate. Hmm? 
Yes, okay. So, there, so it's nice and quiet. I even have my fan off in the background. Okay, that, is that a lot quieter for it? Hmm? Miss Kitty, I recommend you check YouTube. <laughs> I recommend you check YouTube. That might be a little bit better. Sounds good? Okay. Much quieter. We have music going in the background. So, what we will do is we will start off with a poem, and then we will move on to make a choice together on the... on what longer story, a short story to read. Soft notifications are... I have to keep it quiet. Wahaha is gone. Yes, many, many alerts and sound effects and various things have been turned off. Thank you for the bits, Cole Gaku. Thank you for the sub. So, here's everybody's favorite for our first one, all right? Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. To some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was the bleak in, in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden who, whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of every purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, so still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, to some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this is it, and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness, there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming, dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, nearly this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber churning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window, Latisse. Let me see then what thereat it is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many flirt and flutter, there in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, nor a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then the ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what lordly, what thy lordly name is on night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird upon his chamber above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But that raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only. That one word, as if its soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered. Till I scarcely more the muttered, other hopes have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, by reply so aptly spoken, 
doubtless, said I. What it utters is its only stock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that mel melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door, and upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, but this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet look lining that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight glowing o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed by from so an unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepeth from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff, this kind nepeth, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempst tossed thee here ashore, desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror unhaunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a saint and maiden whom angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whose angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest in thy night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above the, my door. Take thy beak from out the, my heart and take thy form off my door. Quoff the raven, never, nevermore. And the raven, never fitting, still sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul out that shadow that flies floating on the floor. <laughs> Shall be lifted evermore. <laughs> Never nyan. 99 head fats? Yeah, we'll hit head fats. We'll hit head fats sometimes. I have to adjust this a little bit. A little bit. Oh, I didn't even show the whole thing. Back. Forbidden head. Forbidden head fats. Go. Oh, that should be good there. That should be good there. Golden bounce. Thank, thank you for the bounce. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for 18 months. I had no idea this poem was this long. It is quite a long poem. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> is this supposed to be spooky? No, oh, it's just, it's, it's, it's the, the raven. Come on. Come on. You have to play along, Booksmith. We can't be too spooky because it's a EG13 stream. <laughs> and thank you, Top Gun. Nyan. We start nyaning nyan. Starts nyaning nyan. And thank you, Butterblocks, for the hydrate, hydrating. Jumper, thanks for 18 months, nyan. Have a good night. Good night, Timari. Alrighty. So. Is this sweetie thinks you represented him wrong? I didn't do it. I didn't write it. Nyan. <laughs> Match with the raven poem with Nyan, though. That would be very difficult to do. Alright, so. So, 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 Nyan. So, 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 Nyan.
Edgar and Onion Poe. Edgar Onion Poe. Can anyone? We have we have the ten minutes, Nyan Nyan, right, Nyan Nyan. Let's see here. Finding the next thing to read, Nyan. And driving yourself mad by grief by asking a parrot that only ever answers no. Right, Nyan? Right, Nyan? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nyan. Let's see here, Nyan. Finding a good one to do. Are you doing more? Yes, this will be the entire stream. Let's see here. I'm finding I'm finding a good one for us to choose from. To check the length of them, Nyan, because if it's too long, then I'm not gonna be able to read it, Nyan. <laughs> if it's too long, it'll be very difficult. Do you want some HP Lovecraft? You do some HP Lovecraft, Nyan. To do the side. And okay, that's too small. to be this large maximum yen. Okay, Nyan. Okay, Nyan. I can work with it, Nyan. There we go, Nyan. Lovecraft is not PG-13. Some of them are. Some of them are, Nyan. If you replace the spoofs with Nyan's Nyan. Okay, I think what I need to do is edit this Nyan. To prevent people from coming in and asking what story is today, Nyan. <laughs> well, they still will ask because that's just how it is here, Nyan. But I'm going to find... Plan, right, Nyan? New drinking game? The new drinking game is anytime somebody asks a question that's on the screen, Nyan. <laughs> then you drink, Nyan. Then you drink, Nyan. Where is my text? Hello, Nyan? Nyan? Okay, fine. This. For the subs, Nyan. And I've wasted by the end of stream, right, Nyan? Right, Nyan.
This one should be okay, Nyan. I would not like to hear a dad joke in ASMR mode. What do you mean, Nyan? What do you mean, Nyan? Alright, let me make sure that this actually scrolls all the way down to the bottom, Nyan. Okay. It does. It does, Nyan. It works, Nyan. Okay, hang on. Let me, so, let me just adjust the microphone a little bit, Nyan. Don't you dare. That can't stop me. I can't read, Nyan. Alright. We shall proceed with the story. So I'll take a sip before we continue. All right. Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft. I am writing this under an ap appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Penniless and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packets of which I was supercargo fell victim to the German Sea Raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation, so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal indeed was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When I at last awakened, it was to discover myself half-sucked into the slimy expanse of hellish black mire which extended about me in a monotonous undulations, as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished, for there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcass of carcasses of uh, decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So- ah! There you go. There you go, Nyan. <laughs> it's hard to do the Nyans while I'm reading Nyan. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean strain my ears as I might. Nor were there any seafowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory for an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. Oh, 
On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it appeared from a distance, an intervening valley setting it out in sharp relief from the greater surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon, I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunrise. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked at the other side to an immeasurable pit or canyon whose black recesses of the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of paradise lost and Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with the difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentle slopes beneath, gazing into the Stygian depths where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude, and its position in an abyss, which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had not had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that the far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping at my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets had washed the base of the Cyclopean monith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols, such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented the marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did, hold, did most to hold me spellbound. Plainly visible across the interweaving water on account of their enormous size was an array of base reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a door. I think the, these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms, I dare not speak in detail, for the mere, for the mere resemblance remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or Bulwer, they were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. 
Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scientific background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then, suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark the, its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemous-like, and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff and my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm sometime after I reached the boat. At any rate, I knew that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by a, the captain of the American ship, which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with Brickett, with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has only given transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Often, I ask myself if it could not at all been a pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever as I lay sunstricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. A day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand. The window. The window. Dun dun dun. Hook hand. Hook hand. Hand door. Thank you for the hydrate. Hydrating <laughs> meow. On Facebook. And thank you, Legit Nith and Experial Experiments. For the two months and dipping dots for the two months. Thank you, thank you. Comfy. Subnautica vibes, truly. You do the inheritance series, I will buy them on all my accounts. <laughs> Unfortunately, in order to be signed on for an audiobook, you have to get the, uh, the author has to agree to have you as the reader. So, Shadow, thank you for the gift subs. Thank you, thank you. Regular door? No, window? Yes. Yes, window. Not scary as much as creepy. That's the kind of horror vibe I like. I like if it's like creepy horror. I like a lot more than than like oh, jump scare sound horror, right? I'm hydrating now, hydrating. Mm -hmm. And 
hold him hostage until he agrees to let you read the inherent series. Oh dear. Oh dear. Please don't read anything but spiders. I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Let's see here. Trying to make sure that it's not super long. We want we want uh we want short stories. I just wanted to get the dig on for beginning readers book. Well, wow. you show five thingies? I can show you ten. Ten fingies. What has been read so far? We just finished Dagon by HP Lovecraft. There it is. There's the thingies. I want to read this one, but unfortunately, like, this website doesn't have a dark mode. Unfortunately, so like it's gonna be bright. Golden That's... salute. Well, TTS, you're still loud. <laughs> hey, Grinchick, thank you very much for three months. Dark reader, I want to read it dark. I want to read it dark. Let's see, these are horror stories from the 1970s. Glad to have made the steam. A welcome way to relax at the end of a long day. Michael Lobos, thank you for three months. <laughs> ten, ten fingers. Ah, ah, ah. Let's see. Most pleasant mode? It is the most pleasant mode, but it's not it's too bright. I don't know if any of those are good. There we go. Let's see. Oh, you know what? You know what? Use reader mode. I don't know if I can have it. That. There we go. Next one to read. Oh, a real life story you could read? I don't know. Oh, ten creepy short stories. There we go. There we go. Somebody said they didn't want to hear spiders. <laughs> but how about we read something with spiders? How about we read something with spiders? <laughs> spiders are always good? Okay, okay. so I can doesn't want to open it. Hang on a sec. Hang on. Oh, 
This one says it's free to read, so better be free to read. <laughs> so I'm a spider, so what? Exactly. Right. So. Uh, Is the Petting Zoo by Peter De Neverville. At first, Johnson thought it was a joke. Speeding down the country road, the crude sign was only a blur. But it was that one word. Slowing down, he swung the Lexus onto the paved shoulder. In the rearview mirror, he could see it clearly. The sign was tacked to a stick that was stuck in the ground just below, just beyond the paved shoulder. Shifting the powerful car into reverse, Johnson jammed the accelerator down. The tires squealed and loose gravel flew as he tore back up the road. Screeching to a halt, Johnson stared at the faded handwriting. Ellsworth's famous spider petting zoo. Five miles next RT. Spiders fascinated Johnson. One summer, when he was eight, a large golden black spider had taken up residence underneath the shingles by the back door. Every morning, Johnson would gather up ants in a jar from a nest in the scrubby woods behind his house. One by one, he would drop the wriggling insects into the web. With lightning speed, the spider would spring from her hiding place and race towards the victim. Sinking her fangs into the ant, she would retreat, waiting for the poison to take effect. When the ant slowly stopped struggling, she would climb back down and delicately wrap her prey in a white shroud. This continued until one day his mother caught him. What a cruel little boy you are, she scolded between clenched teeth as she pummeled his backside. You could still feel the shame of being spanked. Years later, in a rare moment of remorse, Johnson wondered what it was like for the ant, trapped, helpless, waiting for the spider to return. Did they know fear or horror? Or was that something only humans experienced? The insect brain was too small, he told himself. Or so he hoped. Five miles, thought Johnson. This side trip might only add another half hour or so to his journey. He would still have time once he got to his motel to have a shower. The dinner meeting with the buyer from the supermarket chain wasn't until six o'clock and it was only four now. Coasting forward, Johnson scanned the road looking for a turnoff. About 100 yards ahead, he saw a lane that intersected with the highway. Flicking on his turn signal, he shot a quick quick glance at his watch. If I don't find it in 15 minutes, he promised himself. I'll turn back. Accelerating smoothly, he turned onto a well-paved secondary road with deep ditches on either side. Punching the buttons on a CD player, he stretched his arms, settling back into the soft leather seat. As the throbbing beat of Queen filled the Lexus, his mood lightened. An unexpected adventure on an otherwise boring day. Johnson hated his job. Endless meetings with bad food and balding buyers, too many drinks and too many hangovers. He was packing on the pounds too. I have to go back to the gym, he reminded himself. The only redeeming feature of his job was that he was good at it. Top sales rep for the last three years. I should have been an actor, he told himself. Instead, I'm selling toilet paper and tampons to these turkeys. As the needle on the speedometer crept higher and higher, the neatly kept fields and freshly painted houses became a blur. Mile after mile slipped by. Johnson felt that he and the car had become one, soaring along like a hawk on a summer breeze. But his moon soon soured. The condition of the road deteriorated. Asphalt gave way to chip seal, which gave way to gravel, and finally ended up as dirt. Johnson jumped on the brakes when a huge pothole emerged in the center of the road. Cursing the delay, he checked his watch again. It was almost five. The long drive down the country road had dulled his sense of time. I better turn around, he cautioned himself. As he studied the road ahead, looking for a safe place to make a U-turn, he saw it. An old farmhouse set back from the road. If it hadn't been for the pothole, he would have missed it completely. 
By the mailbox, a freshly painted sign read, Ellsworth's famous spider petting zoo, open year round, all visitors welcome. This must be the place, he concluded. Carefully turning up the heavily rutted lane, Johnson wondered what he would find. Perhaps one of the locals playing a joke on the tourists, he mused. Tall grass slapped at the bottom of the car, and rustled barbed wire clung to rotted posts that ran alongside the lane. In the untilled fields, scrubby bushes had sprung up like mushrooms. Johnson tried to imagine what the farm looked like in better days, but it was impossible. When he reached the top of the hill, the farmhouse looked even more decrepit. Blistered paint hung from the wooden shingles, and there was a disturbing sag in the middle of the roof. What had once been the side garden was now occupied by tall thistles and a mass of tangled timbers indicated the former site of the main barn. Except for the glass still being intact on the windows, the house looked abandoned. Where is everybody? thought Johnson. In response to his question, an old woman dressed in a black skirt and a woolen sweater stepped out of the side door. She was gnarled and withered like the lone apple tree that stood in the yard. Johnson guessed she must have been at least 70 or maybe even 80 years old. What do you want? She spat. Turning off the CD player and rolling down the car window, he replied. Is this the petting zoo? That's what the sign says, don't it? Ignoring her rudeness, Johnson's continued. Are you open? I'll get Jake. He's out back chopping wood. He watched as she shuffled down a dirt path and disappeared around a corner of the house. Charming, thought Johnson. Opening the car door, he stepped out. Despite the poverty, the farm had a certain rustic appeal which reminded him of the house that he grew up in the country. But there was something odd, something missing. Where are the flies? thought Johnson. On most farms, the low buzz of the black swarms was constant. But here, there was none. Except for the moaning of the wind, it was quiet. Perhaps it was the lack of animals, he thought. Or maybe it was the stiff breeze at the top of the hill that kept them at bay. Glancing at his watch, he frowned. It was after five o'clock. If he did not get back on the road soon, he would be late for his appointment. Either that or skip his shower. After driving all day, Johnson did not want to skip the soothing ritual. Taking one last look around, he reached for the handle of the car door. Just then, the old woman reappeared, and behind her, an even more wizened-up old man, wearing faded blue overalls and a nicotine-stained undershirt. Stopping at the corner of the house, the old man spat out a long jet of chewing tobacco on the ground. Wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, he paused momentarily to study Johnson. Speaking to the old woman, he said in a low tone, Thought I heard a car come up. Wants to see your spiders, she said, before she turned away and went back into the farmhouse, letting the screen door slam behind her. You want to see my spiders, young fella? Sure, if you're open. How much? Looking over the Lexus, he scratched his ruddy face and said, Fifty bucks. Fifty? That's ridiculous. Shrugging his shoulders, the old man said, Take it or leave it. I got work to do. And then he spat out another long jet of chewing tobacco and turned to go. Can't leave now after coming all this way, thought Johnson. Taking another quick glance at his watch, he said irritably, All right, all right, but this better be good. The old man smirked and licked his lips as Johnson whipped out a crisp $50 bill from his wallet. Johnson did not like the old man's greedy look and hastily shoved his wallet back in his pants pocket. Thanks, said the old man sarcastically, snatching the bill from Johnson's hand. Looking it over carefully, he folded it up neatly, stuck it in his pocket, and said, Follow me. The old man led Johnson down an overgrown path to a shed at the back of the farmhouse. Inside, the dim glow of the fluorescent tubes highlighted the dozen plywood shelves that ran along the walls. In contrast to the rest of the farm, the shed was neat, almost antiseptic in appearance. Sitting on each shelf was a glass terrarium filled with twigs and rocks. In the case closest to Johnson, a small garden spider was spinning a web in the corner. That's an orb spider, said the old man. I know, said Johnson, annoyed by the interruption. You know spiders? A bit, replied Johnson. I used to study them when I was a kid. I bet you're the type that like to feed them, eh? Catch bugs, drop them in, see what happens. Fun, ain't it? Suddenly, Johnson felt uncomfortable. How did he guess my secret? He wondered. 
Johnson felt the warm rush of blood to his neck and ears as he started to blush. No need to be ashamed, young fella. All kids do it. It's natural. Trying to change the topic, Johnson asked, You been at this long? Keeping spiders? Yeah, I've been at it a while. Most folks are scared of spiders. Not me. Me and spiders get along real good. Johnson turned back to watch a large black spider in another case sucking up the half-digested slurry of its latest victim. Trying to be polite, Johnson asked, Bet you don't get many visitors here, being so far from the highway. Don't need them, said the old man. This is just a sideline. Pausing for effect, he added, I breed them. Johnson looked puzzled. For the college, explained the old man. They use them for research. Does it pay well? Good enough. Ah, they don't know squat about spiders, said the old man, spitting on the floor. Johnson looked down and saw that a streak of the sticky black tobacco had splashed on his shoes. I've been doing research of my own, said the old man proudly. Spiders are just like any other critter. Cows, horses, dogs, they're all the same. Breed the best with the best and you get the best, or the... The old man's tri voice trailed off as he started to laugh. There was something about his tone that made Johnson uneasy. You want to see my prize winner? Johnson looked around. Oh, she ain't here. I keep her in the barn. She kind of makes these critters nervous. I can't say I blame some. Want to see her? The way the old man said it, the question sounded more like a challenge. Johnson hesitated. He wanted to say no, but he could not let the old man see he was afraid. Sure, answered Johnson. What could it be, he asked himself. A tarantula? With the old man in front, they went down to a lesser-used path to a small barn behind a stand of trees that made it invisible from the farmhouse. A shiny new lock on a rusted hasp yielded to the man's key. I don't like kids messing with my stuff. The ancient wooden door swung open. Inside it was pitch black. Johnson hesitated. What was it that made him apprehensive? His mouth felt dry and he tried to swallow. Go on in, taunted the old man as he shoved Johnson through the door. Stumbling on the raised sill, Johnson fell to one knee, ripping his pants. Damn it, he cursed. There's a light switch ahead of you, the old man reassured him. Just pull the string. The stench of moldy hay made Johnson gag. Where is it? The spider, he called out. She's in the back. Can't miss her. Where's the light? Right in front of you, can't you see it? Mocked the old man. Johnson stretched out his hand. At first, he could not feel anything. Then slowly groping the air in, he caught a hold of it. Johnson's heart leapt in relief. There was something strange. The line didn't feel like a string. It was sticky. Like a... Pulling the line, Johnson knew he had made a mistake. Something rustled in the rafters above him and bits of straw floated down. Johnson bolted for the opening. Enjoy yourself, cackled the old man as he slammed the door and locked it. Let me out! Let me out! shouted Johnson, pounding on the door. Let me out, you old buzzard! But it was no use. Dried out wooden door was like iron. Pausing to catch his breath, his fists throbbing, Johnson looked around. Slowly, his eyes grew accustomed to the dark. What appeared to be a black chasm was, in fact, the side entrance to the barn. There must be another way out, he thought. But where? In the gloom, he could see that beyond the entryway there was a large open space, and beyond that a boarded up window through which thin shafts of sunlight streamed. Great. All I have to do is cross the barn, pull off one or two of those boards and climb out, thought Johnson. Then I'll show that old man. Fifty bucks? He'll wish I never stopped. Then he heard another rustle overhead and more straw floated down. Who is it? Who's there? He called out. I'll bet it's that old man, thought Johnson. He thinks he's going to scare me. Sure, you just keep that up, old man, Johnson called out again. Let's see how much laughing you do when I bash your face in. But first, I've got to get to that window. Be careful, he cautioned himself. This barn must be full of junk. Don't want to fall down and get hurt. Despite the heat in the barn, he shivered. Licking the sweat off his upper lip, Johnson slowly picked his way across the wide wooden planked barn floor, being careful not to trip. Shadows of old machinery and tools loomed around him. A leather harness that hung from the wall looked like a hangman's noose. There was a peculiar smell too. It reminded him of the package of chicken that he once left in the trunk of his car on a hot summer day. It was the sickly, sweet scent of rotting meat. Oh, gross, muttered Johnson. There's a dead animal in here. In less than a minute, he had crossed the barn and was standing in front of the boarded-up window. Blocking his exit were three boards nailed haphazardly into the frame. 
Either the old man was too weak or too lazy to drive them all, away, all the way in, concluded Johnson. I can probably pull them off with my bare hands, he smiled triumphantly. The first board was half rotted and fell apart in his hands. Light streamed in as it came away from the frame. Then he shifted his attention to the second one, the board in the middle. If he could get this one off, he could easily climb out. But this board wouldn't be so easy. It was like the old door of the barn, dried out and as tough as steel. Gripping the board with both hands, he began pulling. The nails squealed in protest and the board started to move. Only a little bit further, grunted Johnson. The thought of throttling the old man excited him. Just a bit further, another half inch. He could almost feel his fingers closing around the old man's scrawny neck, the eyes bulging, the tongue sticking out. Another half inch. Then it stopped. Desperately, Johnson y yanked at the board, but it was no use. It would not yield. I need more leverage, he thought to himself. Balancing on one foot, he braced his other arm against his other against the window frame and started pulling again. The muscles in his forearms and back bulged as he strained against the board. Sweat rolled down his forehead and into his eyes. Come on, he pleaded with the wood. Come on. In his frustration, Johnson did not hear the soft tap, tap, tap on the floor behind him. Tap, 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 like a blind man with its cane. Tap, tap, tap. Then it was too late. It struck. The force of the attack rammed him face first against the wall, knocking the wind out of him. Warm blood trickled from his nose and ran down his cheek. What was that? Turning around slowly, he could see, in the light from the window, his attacker. It was crouched inside an empty stall along the opposite wall. The legs tensed, ready to spring. It was a spider. No doubt one of the old man's experiments, but this was no ordinary spider. It was huge. About the size of a pit bull, with legs that extended out three or four feet on either side. Its, air, its eyes stared coldly at him. Johnson did a quick tally of his injuries. Except for his bloody nose, he was unharmed. unharmed. Perhaps the large size of the creature made it difficult for it to mount an attack, he conjectured. Possibly it did not even recognize him as prey. Spiders normally eat moths and insects, he reminded himself. Not human beings. When he was a kid, Johnson liked to throw twigs into a web just to see the spider's reaction. Invariably, after pouncing on the object, the spider would pluck it out of the web, turn it over, and drop it on the ground. Johnson hoped the spider would show the same lack of interest. From its vantage point on the, at the other side of the bar, at the other end of the barn, the creature seemed puzzled, unsure of itself. Spiders are cautious, he told himself. It's waiting for me to make the next move. Although every fiber in his body screamed run, his brain told him to stay still. The spider was too big and too fast to outrun. I need a weapon, he told himself. Quickly looking about, he saw the rotten board from the window lying at his feet. It was about two feet long with a jagged point at one end. It'll have to do. Slowly, he bent down to pick it up. The spider crouched low like a sprinter, ready to strike again. Johnson froze, his fingers only inches from the board. Easy, girl, whispered. Easy. The spider relaxed, but not completely. Deliberately, it began to move forward. Tap, tap, tap. Johnson was amazed by the creature's grace. Like a ballerina tiptoeing in from the darkened wings of a theater, it was a marvel of beauty and design. The body, covered by fine gray hair, had the look of velvet, while the eight legs that extended from the thorax provided speed and balance. As it approached Johnson, the spider carefully extended one foreleg towards him. Johnson quickly knocked it away with his hand. The creature stopped and cocked its plate-sized head to one side. The eight eyes looked like black fists. Then the leg came forward again. At the tip, Johnson could see the spike-like claw for catching prey. It touched his left shoulder. Through his jacket, he could feel the sharp point digging into his skin. Johnson winced and stepped backwards into the wall, but there was no place to go. Slowly, the other foreleg came forward. Johnson recoiled, trying to ward off the attack with his free arm, but the creature was too strong. It brushed his arm aside as if it was a piece of lint and planted a second claw into his other shoulder. Johnson cried out, Help! Help! Then the spider reared up on its hind legs, forcing Johnson to his knees. For a brief moment, he and the creature looked into each other's eyes. It was almost like love. 
Then he saw the six-inch fangs that extended from the head. Drops of venom gleamed in the half-light. He watched in fascination as the cruel daggers arced high over him, and he screamed as they plunged deeply into his chest. Instantly, white-hot pain ripped through his body. Then it was gone. The spider had retreated back to the wall. Johnson knew that he only had a minute or two before the poison paralyzed him. This is it, he said to himself, my only chance. Ignoring his wounds, Johnson turned back to the window. Grabbing at the board, he yanked and pulled to no avail. Already the venom was having its effect. His hands grew numb and his arms felt like lead. Gasping for air, he threw himself at the boards again and again, but it was no use. He was beaten. Great sobs shook his body as he slumped to the floor. This can't be happening to me, he protested. It's ridiculous. Looking back at the spider, he could see that it had still not moved. What is she waiting for, he wondered. Why doesn't she finish me off? Soon, he had his answer. Shimmering like a great overcoat, there was something on the spider's back. It moved and undulated like a small wave flowing back and forth. Then, a piece of the wave pulled away and dropped to the floor. It was another spider, only a lot smaller, about the size of a rat. Johnson recalled that some spiders carry their young on their backs. Horrified, he realized that he had stumbled into their nursery and it was feeding time. Another one dropped to the floor, and then another. Soon, there was a long line of spiders slowly crawling towards him. Through fading eyesight, he saw the first one reach his foot. Tentatively, its foreleg probed the air until it found its leg and patted it. It was light and, deli it was light and delicate, like the touch of a child. Johnson opened his mouth to scream, but no sound came. The last thing Johnson saw before he lost consciousness was a spider tearing a piece of flesh from the back of his hand. Back at the farmhouse, the old man picked up the whiskey bottle from the kitchen table and poured himself another drink and plopped down on the ancient Lazy Boy recliner. How long a take, Jake? asked the old woman. How long, he grunted. They ain't et since Sunday. Get a better sign, attract more folks. Ah, sign's okay. Anyway, we don't need a crowd, said the old man, taking a long, hard swallow. What you gonna do with this car? she asked, standing at the window, admiring the now ownerless Lexus. I hear young Duggle needs one for running moonshine, willing to pay a good price, too, said the old man. Won't he ask questions? wondered the old woman, pouring a drink and easing herself down into a dusting couch. Nah, he don't care, snickered the old man. Let's talk to him tomorrow. Meanwhile, pass the remote. Let's see what's on Dr. Phil. The end. <laughs> F's in the chat for Johnson. Should have turned around. Should have turned around. Thank you for the hydrates hydrating now. <laughs> the end on Dr. Phil, those animals, those animals. He was kind of a peepee. -pee. He really was a big peepee. -pee. What a heckin' peepee. -pee. What a heckin' peepee. -pee. <laughs> Thousand baby spiders. No thing. We used to get mental advice from TV, right? That was stressful. Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Comfy, spooky stories. Let's see, what's another good one? Quite wacky. <laughs> More spooters? <laughs> no more spiders, please. <laughs> Ever thought of looking through Reddit horror stories? I do like the Reddit horror stories. Although you never know what the Reddit horror stories if they're actually um you can actually read through them or not. Cause some people wind up uh publishing their stories later, so it's hard to say. Gosh, I really like the Reddit ones though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll be sleeping to these. Well, they're too spooky. 
was spooky for you. This is why I hate spiders. Actually, maybe I should read one of the cop the creepy pastas. Katie Lots, thank you for three months. Thank you. Happy spooky month, Golden Cheer. <laughs> stairs in the Woods from Reddit? I could read the Stairs in the Woods. Oh, what's the name? What's the subreddit with like the the horror stories, but you have to pretend it's true? Yeah, no sleep. Oh my gosh, I used to binge no sleep. I worked a job in an office that didn't require me to like do too much stuff, and I would just binge read. College, I did that a lot too. I love no sleep. It's so good. It's so good. I'm trying to find one that that I recognize. But sometimes this can scare myself into not sleeping, right? <gasps> yes, okay, search and rescue for the U.S. Forest Service. Let's zoom this in a little bit so we can read it well. Going to the woods. Tough out for now. Okay, see you later, Booksmith. Thanks for being here. All right. This, this story is six years old. Use dark mode. I can't activate dark mode. It won't let us. It won't let me. <laughs> I don't, I, since I'm, I don't have a, oh, wait. Oh, can I just turn on night mode? Yes. Okay. Night mode's on. Got it. I figured it out. Nice dark mode when DM's reading so that we can have it like nice and dark. So if there's anybody that's currently trying to fall asleep to this, I hope you don't have nightmares. There we go. Got me. You told me, okay. I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. I have some stories to tell. I wasn't sure where else to post these stories, so I figured I'd share them here. I've been an SAR officer for a few years now, and along the way I've seen some things that I think you guys will be pretty interested in. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time, they just wander off of the path, slip, or slip down a small cliff, and they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard of the old stay where you are thing, and they don't wander far, but I've had two cases where that didn't happen. Both bothered me a lot, and I use them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together, and both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for a few seconds, and in that time both the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly, and when we asked where her brother was, she told us that he had been taken away by the bear man. 
She said he gave her berries and told her to stay quiet, that he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was also insistent that he wasn't a normal man, but that he was tall and covered in hair like a bear, and that he had a weird face. We searched that area for weeks. It was one of the longest calls I've ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandpa. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she never came back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere, and we never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could have possibly gone because neither her mother or her grandpa saw her come down. A few times, I've been out on my own searching with a canine, and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs. Not hills. Not even rock faces. Straight, sheer cliffs with no possible handholds. It's always baffling, and in those cases we usually find the person on the other side of the cliff or miles away from where the canine had led us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particularly sad case involved the recovery of a body. A nine-year-old girl fell down an embankment and got impaled on a dead tree at the base. It was a complete freak accident, but I'll never forget the sound her mother made when we told her what had happened. She saw the body bag being loaded into the ambulance, and she let out the most haunting, heartbroken wail I've ever heard. It was like her whole life came crashing down around her, and part of her had died with her daughter. I heard from another SAR officer that she killed herself a few weeks after that happened. She couldn't live with the loss of her daughter. I was teamed up with another SAR officer because we'd received report of bears, reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip when he was supposed to, and we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevasse with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He'd been there for almost two days, and his leg was very obviously infected. We were able to get him into a chopper, and I heard from one of the EMTs that the guy was absolutely inconsolable. He kept talking about how he had been doing fine, and when he got to the top, a man had been there. He said the guy had no climbing equipment and was wearing a parka and ski pants. He walked up to the guy, and when the guy turned around, he said he had no face. It was just blank. He freaked out and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast, which is why he'd fallen. He said he could hear the guy all night, climbing down the mountain, letting out these horrible muffled screams. That story bothered the heck out of me. I'm glad I wasn't there to hear it. One of the scariest things I've ever had happen to me involved the search for a young woman who'd gotten separated from her hiking group. We were out until late at night because the dogs had picked up her stent. When we found her, she was curled up under a large rotted log. She was missing her shoes and pack and was cle clearly in shock. She didn't have any injuries and we were able to get her to walk with us back to base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us and asking us why the big man with black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we wrote it off as some weird symptom of shock. But the closer we got to base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell him to... She kept asking me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point, she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest, saying she didn't wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said, and she wouldn't give him give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, but we started hearing these weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but more rhythmic and deeper. It was almost insect-like. I don't really know how else to describe it. When we were within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me, and her eyes are about as wide as I can imagine a human could open them. She touches my shoulder and says, He says to tell you to speed up. He doesn't like looking at the scar on your neck. I have a very small scar on the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar and I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she says it, I hear that weird coughing right in my ear, and I just about jumped out of my skin. I hustled her to the ops, trying to not show how freaked out I was, but I have to say I was really happy when we left the area that night. This is the last one I'll tell, and it's probably the weirdest story I have. 
Now, I don't know if this is true in every SAR unit, but in mine, it's kind of an unspoken, regular thing we run into. You can try asking about it with other SAR officers, but even if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by our superiors, and at this point, we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't seem like it's that weird anymore. On just about every case where we're really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took the stairs in your house, cut them out, and put them in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw one, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told very emphatically that I should never go near any of them just sort of ignore them now when I run into them because it happens so frequently. Staircase. The stair. Part two. I'll skip the first part because it's not a story. There was a lot of feedback about the stairs, so I'll touch on that briefly here, and I'll also include a story. They come in a variety of shapes, sizes, styles, and conditions. Some are pretty dilapidated, just ruins, but others are brand new. I saw one that looked like they came from a lighthouse. They were metal and spiral, almost old-fashioned. The stairs don't go up infinitely, or farther than I can see, but some sets are taller than others. Like I said before, just imagine the stairs in your house as if someone cut and pasted them in the middle of nowhere. I don't have any pictures, it's never really occurred to me to try again after the first time, and I don't really feel like risking my job over it. I'll try again in the future, but I can't really promise anything. A few people expressed confusion about the guy who ran into the man with no face. Just to clarify, when the climber ascended and reached the top of this peak, he saw another man in a parka and ski pants. This was the man with no face. <laughs> Sorry about the confusing wording. I'll try to fix that. All right, on to the news stories. As far as missing persons go, I'd say about half the calls I get are related to that. The others are rescue calls. People who fall down cliffs and hurt themselves, get injured by fire, you wouldn't believe how often this happens, mostly drunk kids, get bitten or stung by animals or insects. We're a tight team, and we have veterans who are excellent at finding signs of lost people. That's what makes these cases where we never find any trace of them so frustrating. One in particular was upsetting for all of us because we did find a trace of them, but it just led to more questions than answers. An older man had been hiking alone on a well-established trail, but his wife called to say that he hadn't come home when he should have. Apparently, he had a history of seizures and she was worried that he had taken his medis he hadn't taken his medication and had su suffered one out on the trail. Before you ask, I have no idea why he thought it was okay to go out alone or why she didn't go with him. I don't ask about that kind of thing because it's past a certain point, it doesn't really matter. Someone is missing and it's my job to find them. We went out in a standard search formation and it wasn't long before one of our vets found signs that the guy had gone off the trail. We gripped up and followed him, spreading out in a fan to make sure we were covering up as much ground as possible. Suddenly, a call comes over the radio telling us all to head back to the vet's location, and we come right away because this and usually means the missing, person, the missing person is injured, and we need a full team to help get them out safely. We meet back up, and the vet is just standing at the base of a tree with his hands on the sides of his head. I ask my buddy what's going on, and he points up into the branches of the tree. I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing, but there's a walking stick dangling from a branch at least 30 feet off the ground. The little strap on the handle has been looped around the branch, and it's just hanging there. There's no way the guy could have tossed it up that far, and we don't see any other signs that he's still in the area. We call up into the tree, but it's obvious no one's in it. We're all just sort of left scratching our heads. We keep searching for the guy, but we never find him. We eventually, we even bring our canines out, but they lose his scent along long before this tree. Eventually, the search is called off because there are other calls we have to attend to, and at past a certain point, there's not much we can do. The guy's wife called us every day for months, asking if we'd found her husband, and it was heartbreaking to hear her get more and more hopeless each time. I'm not sure why this call in particular was so upsetting, but I think it was just the sheer improbability of it. 
that and the questions that were raised. How the heck did this guy's cane ended up there? Did someone kill him and toss it up there like some weird trophy? We did our best to find him, but it was almost like a taunt. We still talk about that one from time to time. Thank you, bat. The caps, thanks for the hydrate. Hydrating now. If you go up the stairs, you become a tree. They don't know where he went. They don't know where he went. Stop smiling before you read about missing kids. Don't worry, don't worry. Missing kids are the most heartbreaking. It doesn't matter what circumstances they go missing under. It's never easy, and we always, always dread the ones we find deceased. It's not common, but it does happen. David Pauldes, Pauldes talks a lot about kids' SAR teams. Boop. Kid. Thank you for the boop. <laughs> Thank you for tweets. The SAR teams they find in places they shouldn't be or couldn't be. I can honestly say I've heard about this kind of thing happening more than I've seen it, but I'll share one of the ones that I think about a lot that I witnessed personally. A mother and her three kids were out for a picnic in an area of the park that has a small lake. One is six, one is five, and the other is about three. She's, she's watching them all really closely, and according to her, she never lets them out of her sight at any time. She never saw anyone else in the area either, which is important. She packs their stuff up, and they start to head back to the parking area. Now, this lake is only about two miles into the woods, and it's very clearly established on a very clearly established trail. It's almost impossible to get lost getting from the parking area to it unless you're deliberately going off the path like an imbecile. Her kids are walking in front of her when she hears what sounds like someone coming up on the path behind her. She turns around, and in the four or so seconds she's not looking, her five-year-old son vanishes. She figures he stepped off the trail to pee or something, and she asks her other two where he went. They both tell her that a big man with a scary face came out of the woods next to them, took the kid's hand, and led him into the trees. The two remaining kids don't seem upset. In fact, she says later that it seems like they've been drugged. They're sort of spacey and fuzzy. So of course, she freaks out and starts looking frantically in the area for her kid. She's screaming his name, and she says at one point she thinks he sure she heard him answer. Now, obviously, she can't go blindly running into the woods, and she's got two other kids, so she calls the police and they send us out immediately. We respond and we start the search for him. Over the course of the search, which spans miles, we never find a single trace of the kid. Canines can't pick up any scent, we don't find any clothing or broken bushes or literally anything that would signify a child being there. Of course, there's suspicion about the mother for a while, but it's pretty clear that she's completely destroyed by the whole thing. We looked for this kid for weeks with a lot of volunteer help, but eventually the search peters out and we have to move on. The volunteers keep searching though, and one day we get a call on the radio letting us know that a body has been found and needs to be recovered. They tell us the location and none of us can believe it. We figure it has to be a different kid, but we go out there about 15 miles from the site we where he had vanished, and sure enough, we find the body of the kid we're looking for. I've been trying to figure out how this kid got where he did ever since we found him, and I've never come up with an answer. A volunteer just happened to be in the area because he figured he might as well look in places no one else would think to, on the off chance the body had been dumped. He comes to the base of a tall, rocky slope, and halfway up, he sees something. He looks through his binoculars, and sure enough, it's the body of a little boy stuffed in an opening in the rock. He recognizes the color of the kid's shirt, so he knows right away that it's the missing body. That's when he calls in, and we're dispatched. It took us almost an hour to get his body down, and none of us could believe what we were seeing. Not only was this kid 15 miles from where he had started, there was no possible way he could have gotten up there on his own. The slope is treacherous, and it's hard even for us with our climbing gear. A five-year-old boy has no way of getting up there I'm that I'm certain. Not only that, but the kid doesn't have a scratch on him. His shoes are gone, but his feet aren't damaged or dirty. So it wasn't as if an animal had dragged him up there. And from what I can tell, he hasn't been dead that long. He'd been out there over a month by that point, and he looked like he'd only been dead for at most a day or two. The whole thing was unbelievably strange, and one of the most disconcerting calls that I'd ever been on. We found out later that the coroner determined the kid had died from exposure. He'd frozen to death, probably late at night, two days before we found him. There were no suspects and no answers. To date, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. Dun, dun, dun. 
Because in those sleep reddits, yeah, we're reading this one and we'll go back to the other, uh, the other ones. Poor kid. Poor kid. One of my first jobs as a trainee was a search op for a four-year-old kid that had gotten separated from his mom. This was one of the cases where we knew we were going to find him because the dogs were on a strong scent trail, and we saw clear signs that he was in the area. We ended up finding him in a berry patch about half a mile from where he'd been last seen. The kid wasn't even aware that he'd wandered that far. One of the vets brought him back, which I was glad for because I'm not really good with kids and I find it hard to talk to them and keep them company. As my trainer and I are headed back, she decides to take me on a detour to show me one of the hot spots where we tend to find missing people. It's a natural dip in the land near a popular trail and people will usually move downhill because it's easier. We hike out there, it's a few miles away and we get there in about an hour or so. As we're walking around the area and she's pointing out places she's found people in the past, I see something in the distance. Now this area we're in is about eight miles from the main parking area, though there's back roads you can take to get closer if you don't want to hike that far. But we're on state protected land, which means there can't be any kind of commercial or residential development out there. The most you'll ever see is a fire tower or makeshift shelter that homeless people think they can get away with building. But I can see from here that whatever this thing is has straight edges, and if there's any one thing you learn quickly, it's that nature rarely makes straight lines. I point it out, but she doesn't say anything. She just hangs back and lets me wander over and check it out. I get within 20 feet of it, and all the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It's a staircase. In the middle of the hecking woods. In the proper context, it would literally be the most benign thing ever. It's just a normal staircase with a beige carpet, about 10 steps tall. But instead of being in a house where it obviously should be, it's out there in the middle of the woods. The sides aren't carpeted, obviously, and I can see the wood it's made of. It's almost like a video game glitch where the house has failed to load completely and the stairs are the only thing visible. I stand there and it's like my brain is working overtime to try and make sense of what I'm seeing. My trainer comes and stands next to me and she just stands there casually, looking at it as if it's the least interesting thing in the I asked her what the heck this thing is doing here, and I, she just chuckles. Get used to it, rookie. You're going to see a lot of them. I start to move closer, but she grabs my arm. Hard. I wouldn't do that, she says. Her voice is casual, but her grip is tight, and I just stand there looking at her. You're going to see them all the time, but don't go near them. Don't touch them. Don't go up to them. Just ignore them. I start to ask her about it, but something in the way she's looking at me tells me it's best if I don't. We end up moving on, and the subject doesn't come up ever again for the rest of my training. She was right, though. I'd say about every fifth call I go on, I end up running across a set of stairs. Sometimes they're relatively close to the path, maybe within two or three miles. Sometimes they're 20, 30 miles out, literally in the middle of nowhere, and I only find them during the broadest searches or training weekends. They're usually in a good condition, but sometimes they look as if they've been out there for miles. All different kinds, all different sizes. The biggest I ever saw looked like they came out of a turn-of-the-century mansion and were at least 10 feet wide, with steps leading up at least 15 or 20 feet. I've tried talking about it with people, but they just give me the same response as my trainer did. It's normal, don't worry about it. They're not a big deal, but don't go close to them or up them. When trainees ask me about it now, I give them the same response. I don't really know what else to tell them. I'm really hoping someday I get a better answer, but it hasn't happened yet. Only stairs, nothing else. Just stairs. Just stairs. There's some good, some good uh, pictures that people have made with uh, staircases in the woods. Look, go up it for fifty dollars. No, they said no. This is another one that was less spooky and more sad. A young man went missing late in winter when realistically no one should be going that far out onto the trails. We close a lot of them, but some remain open year round unless there's a heck ton of snow. We did an op for him, but we had about six feet of snow on the ground. It was an unusually heavy snow year, and we knew it wasn't likely that we'd find him until spring when the thaw came. Sure enough, when the first big thaw came, a hiker reported a body a little ways off the main trail. We found him at the base of a tree in a pile of melted snow. I knew right away what had happened, and it scared the living heck out of me. 
Most of you who ski or snowboard or spend any amount of time on a mountain will probably guess it too. In snowfalls, it doesn't collect as thick in the areas between the branches. It happens most with fir trees, because they have a sort of closed umbrella shape. So what you end up with is a space around the base of a tree that's filled with a mixture of loose, powdery snow, air, and branches. They're called tree wells, and they're not immediately obvious if you don't know what you're looking for. We put up signs in the welcome centers, big ones, letting people know how dangerous they are, but every year we get that an unusual amount of snow, at least one person doesn't read them or doesn't take the warning seriously, and we find out about it in the spring. My best guess is that this young man was hiking and got tired or maybe a cramp from walking in the deep snow. He went to go sit at the base of the tree, not knowing that there was a tree well and fell in. He got stuck with his feet up and the surrounding snow caved in around him. Unable to free himself, he suffocated. It's called snow immersion suffocation and it doesn't usually happen except in snow. But if you get stuck in a weird position like this guy did, even six feet of snow can be lethal. What scared me the most was imagining how he must have struggled upside down in the freezing cold. He didn't die quickly. Snow would have formed a dense, heavy pile on top of him, and it would have been literally impossible to get out. As it got harder to breathe, he would have known what was happening. I can't even imagine what he was thinking in his last moments. We definitely have uh, snow wells a lot of the time here in Canada. So... If you're out with friends, it's... Uh, a lot less spooky, but I don't know if you've ever been walking and you've realized uh, that you've stepped somewhere that uh, the snow isn't as dense, well, as strong as you thought, and your leg just goes straight through. Never been around snow. Tree wells are actually something that happens. Is it similar to a drift that makes a ditch look like level ground? Yes, yeah, similar to that. It's just right below the tree. So, um, what happens is you'll get a lot of snow, and it will pile up in most other areas, and it will look like it's piled up around the base of the tree but you don't realize that there's maybe a depth of like four to five feet of snow that you're standing on top of. And the tree well is very loose snow. So you step into the tree well and you just drop because it's not dense snow. Yeah, don't leave the trail. If you're in Canada and you're not used to snow, don't leave the trail. Just stay on the trail, follow the trail. It's like snow quickstand, yep, yep. If you're with people, it's a lot easier to get out, but if you're by yourself, it really sucks. <laughs> Heck and hydrate, thank you, Zenith. I'll Oop, that is my bottle. Thank you, bottle. Hydrating now. Is it that hard to escape? Um, it can be. If you stay calm and you move methodically out, it's not my birthday, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, if you move slowly and methodically, it's a lot easier to get out of them. But the other thing is like being able to test and make sure uh, of where you're at. Hmm? All right. The goat man. It's not my birthday. The goat man. A lot of my less outdoorsy friends want to know if I've ever seen the goat man while I've been out on calls. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I've never had anything quite like that happen. I guess the closest was the whole black-eyed man thing, but I didn't see anything. However, there was one call where I had something similar happen, but I'm not sure I'm willing to chalk it up to the goat man. We got in a report that an older woman had fainted along one of the trails and needed assistance getting back down to the main area. We hike up to where she's at, and her husband is just beside himself. He runs, well, I guess more jogs to us, and tells us that he was a little ways off the trail looking at something. His wife starts screaming behind him. He runs back to her, and she's passed out on the trail. We get her on a backboard, and as we're getting her down to the welcome center, she comes to and starts screaming again. I calm her down and ask her what happened. I can't remember ver verbatim what she said, but essentially what happened was this. 
She'd been waiting for her husband when she started hearing the really strange sounds. She said it sounded like a cat, that it was off somehow, and she couldn't quite figure out why. She went a little ahead to try and hear it better, and it sounded like it was coming closer. She said it was close, the closer it got, the more uneasy she was, until she finally figured out what was wrong. I do remember this next part because it was so weird that I don't think I could forget it if I tried. It wasn't a cat. It was a man saying the word meow over and over, just meow, meow, meow. But it wasn't a man, it couldn't have been, because I've never heard a man make his bo voice buzz like that. I thought my hearing aid was going out, but it wasn't. I adjusted it, and it still sounded all buzzy. It was awful. It was coming closer, but I couldn't see him. And the closer he got, the more scared I was, and the last thing I remember was a shape coming out of the trees. I guess that's when I fainted. Now, obviously, I'm a little perplexed as to why a guy would be out in the hiking woods chanting meow meow at people. So once we get down the mountain, I tell my superior that I'm going to search the area to see if I can find the man. He gives me the go-ahead and I grab a radio and hike back to where she fainted. I don't see anyone, so I keep going about a mile more, and when I head back to go off the trail, I, when I head back, I go off the trail to see if I can figure out where she saw him coming from. It's almost sunset by this point. I don't have any desire to be out at night alone, so I just sort of write it off and make a mental note to check it out again tomorrow. But, as I'm headed back, I start to hear something in the distance. I stop and call for anyone in the immediate area to identify themselves. The sound didn't come closer or get louder, but it sounded exactly like a man saying, Meow, meow. This really odd monotone. As comical as it makes it sound, it was almost like that guy on South Park with the Electrolarnix, Ned. I go off the trail in the direction I think it's coming from, but I never seem to get closer. It's almost like it's coming from all directions. Eventually, it just sort of fades out and I end up going back to the welcome center. I didn't get any further reports like that, and even though I went back to the area, I never heard the exact sound again. I suppose it could have been some stupid kid out there messing with people, but you and I have to admit it was weird. Dun dun dun! Building stairs in the woods, that's me! That's me. Let's see here. this one wasn't so long it's one that i would like to read it's too long it's too long <laughs> see but i'm tish thank you very much spoopy for five girl months. and cheer girl and bounce spoopy manga anthology i have not what's the name of that subreddit oh it is no sleep no sleep Let's see would you like some hg wells some H.G. Wells. Make this bigger so it's easier for me to read. <laughs> read the Red Room. The Bright. I'm sorry. 
sorry. The light is so bright. I'm sorry. Oh, you know what I You know what I can do? What? Make it so he does the opposite. Color correction to work. I don't think that one works. I need it to be to invert the color. I don't think I can. You do that way. Dull, but is it still readable? Read any rules to follow stories? I have not. Much better? Okay. In case people join the mail stuff. Um, yes and no. Also, because I don't want to be trapped in too long of a story and then not be able to finish reading it. Hey. Thank you for the hydrate. Hydrating now. So, the story is by H.G. Wells. It's known as The Red Room. H.G. Wells is responsible for The War of the Worlds and The Invisible Man. And this one is from 1986, 18, 1896. It's a gothic horror story about a man who spends a night in a haunted room hoping to prove that it is not haunted at all. Which sounds like something that all of you might do. <laughs> I can assure you, said I, that it will take a very tangible ghost to frighten me, and I stood up before the fire with a glass, with my glass in my hand. It is your own choosing, said the man with the withered arm, and glanced at me askance. Eight and twenty years, said I, I have lived, and never a ghost have I seen as yet. The old woman st sat staring hard into the fire, her pale eyes wide open. I, she broke in. And eight and twenty years you have lived and never seen the likes of this house, I reckon. There's many things to see, when one's still but eight and twenty. She swayed her head slowly from side to side. A many things to see and sorrow for. I half suspected the old people were trying to enhance the spiritual terrors of their house by their droning insistence. I put down my empty glass on the table and looked about the room and caught a glimpse of myself, quite abbreviated and broadened to an impossible sturdiness in the queer old mirror at the end of the room. Well, I said, if I see anything tonight, I shall be so much the wiser, for I come to the business with an open mind. It's your own choosing, said the man with the withered arm once more. I heard the sound of a stick and a shambling step on the flags in the passage outside, and the door creaked on its hinges as the second old man entered, more bent, more wrinkled, more aged even than the first. He supported himself by a single crutch. His eyes were covered by a shade, and his lower lip, half averted, hung pale and pink from his decaying yellow teeth. He made straight for an armchair on the opposite side of the table, sat down clumsily, and began to cough. The man with the withered arm gave this newcomer a short glance of positive dislike. The old woman took no notice of his arrival, but remained with her eyes fixed steadily fire. I said, It's your own choosing, said the man with the withered arm when the coughing had ceased for a while. It is my own choosing, I answered. The man with the shade became aware of my presence for the first time and threw his head back for a moment sideways to see me. I caught a momentary glimpse, glimpse of his eyes, small and bright and inflamed. Then he became, began to cough and sputter again. "'Why don't you drink?' said the man with the withered arm, pushing the beer towards him. The man with the shade poured out a glassful with a shaking hand that splashed half as much again on the, de on the deal table. A monstrous shadow of him crouched upon the wall and mocked his action as he poured and drank. I must confess, I had scarce expected these grotesque custodians. There is to my mind something inhuman in senility, something crouching and atavistic, 
the human qualities seemed to drop from old people insensibly day by day. The three of them made me feel uncomfortable with their gaunt silences, their bent carriage, their evident unfriendliness to me and to one another. If, said I, you will show me to this haunted room of yours, I will make myself comfortable there. The old man with the cough jerked his head back so suddenly that it startled me, shot another glance of his red eyes at me from under the shade, but no one answered me. I waited a minute, glancing from one to the other. If, said a little louder, if you will show me to this haunted room of yours, I will relieve you from the task of entertaining me. There's a candle on the slab outside the door, said the man with the withered arm, looking at my feet as he addressed me. But if you go to the red room tonight, this night of all nights, said the old woman, you go alone. Very well, I answered. And which way do I go? Go along the passage for a bit, said he, until you come to a door. And through that is a spiral staircase, and halfway up that is a landing, and another door covered with a baize. Go through that and down the long corridor to the end, and the red room is on your left up the steps. Have I got that right? I said, and repeated his directions. He corrected me in one particular. And are you really going? Said the man with the shade, looking at me again for the third time with that queer, unnatural tilting of the face. This night of all nights! said the old woman. It is what I came for, I said, and moved towards the door. As I did so, the old man with the shade rose and staggered round the table, so as to be closer to the others and to the fire. At the door I turned and looked at them, and saw they were all close together, dark against the firelight, staring over their shoulders with an intent expression on their ancient faces. Good night, I said, setting the door open. It's your own choosing, said the man with the withered arm. I left the door wide open until the candle was well alight, and then I shut them in and walked down the chilly, echoing passage. I must confess that the oddness of these three old pensioners in whose charge her ladyship had left the castle, and the deep-toned, old-fashioned furniture of the housekeeper's room in which they foregathered affected me in spite of my efforts to keep myself at matter-of-fact phase. They seemed to belong to another age, an older age, an age when things spiritual were different from this of ours, less certain, an age when omens and witches were credible, and ghosts beyond denying. Their very existence was spectral, the cut of their clothing, fashions born in dead brains, the ornaments and conveniences of the room about them were ghostly, the thoughts of vanished men, which still haunted rather than participated in the world of today. But, with an effort, I sent such thoughts to the right about. The long, draughty subterranean passage was chilly and dusty, and my candle flared and made the shadows cower and quiver. The echoes rang up and down the spiral staircase, and a shadow came sweeping up after me, and one fled before me into the darkness overhead. I came to the landing and stopped there for a moment, listening to a rustle, a rustling that I fancied I'd heard. Then, satisfied of the absolute silence, I pushed open the base-covered door and stood in the corridor. The effect was scarcely what I expected, for the moonlight coming in by the great window on the grand staircase picked out everything in vivid black shadow or silvery illumination. Everything was in its place. The house might have been deserted on the yesterday instead of 18 months ago. There were candles in the sockets of the sconces, and whatever dust had gathered on the carpets or upon the polished flooring was distributed so evenly as to be invisible in the moonlight. I was about to advance, and stopped abruptly. Bronze groups stood upon the landing, hidden from me by the corner of the wall, but its shadows fell with marvelous distinctness upon the white paneling and gave me the impression of someone crouching to waylay me. I stood rigid for half a minute, perhaps. Then, with my hand in, my, in the pocket that held my revolver, I advanced, only to discover a Ganymede and Eagle glistening in the moonlight. That incident for a time restored my nerve, and a porcelain Chinaman on a bull table, whose head rocked silently as I passed him, scarcely startled me. The door to the red room and the steps up to it were in a shadowy corner. 
I moved my candle from side to side in order to see clearly the nature of the recesses in which I stood before opening the door. Here it was, I th thought I, that my predecessor was found, and the memory of that story gave me a sudden twinge of apprehension. I glanced over my shoulder at the Ganymede in the moonlight, and opened the door of the red room rather hastily, with my face half turned to the pallid silence of the landing. I entered, closed the door behind me at once, turned the key I found in the lock within, and stood with the candle held aloft, surveying the scene of my vigil, the great red room of Lorraine Castle, in which the young duke had died. Or rather, in which he had begun his dying, for he had opened the door and fallen headlong down the steps I had just ascended. That had been the end of his vigil, his gallant attempt to conquer the ghostly tradition of the, pa of the place, and never, I thought, had apoplexy better served the ends of superstition. And there were other and older stories that clung to the room, back to the half-credible beginning of it all, the tale of a timid wife and the tragic end that came to her husband's jest of frightening her. And looking around that large, somber room, with its shadowy window bays, its recesses and cloves, one could well understand the legends that had sprouted in its black corners, its germinating darkness. My candle was a little tongue of light in its vastness that failed to pierce the opposite end of the room, and left an ocean of mystery and suggestion beyond its island of light. I resolved to make a systematic examination of the place at once and dispel the fanciful suggestions of its obscurity before they obtained a hold upon me. After satisfying myself of the fastening of the door, I began to walk about the room, peering round each article of furniture, tucking up the valances of the bed and opening the curtains wide. I pulled up the blinds and examined the fastenings of several windows before closing the shutters, leant forward and looked up the blackness of the wide chimney and tapped the dark oak paneling for any secret opening. There were two big mirrors in the room, each with a pair of sconces bearing candles, and on the mantel shelf too were more candles and china candlesticks. All of these I lit, one after the other. The fire was laid, an unexpected consideration from the old housekeeper, and I lit it to keep down any disposition to shiver, and when it was burning well I stood round with my back to it and regarded the room again. I had pulled up a chintz-covered armchair and a table to form a kind of barricade before me, and on this lay my revolver, ready to hand. My precise examination had done me good, but I still found the remoter darkness of the place and its perfect stillness too stimulating for the imagination. The echoing of the stir and crackling of the fire was no sort of comfort to me. The shadow of the clove at the end in particular had that undefinable quality of a presence, that odd suggestion of a lurking living thing that comes so easily in silence and solitude. At last, to reassure myself, I walked with a candle into it and satisfied myself that there was nothing tangible there. I stood that candle upon the floor of the clove and left it in that position. By this time, I was in a state of considerable nervous tension. Although to my reason, there was no adequate, qua adequate cause for my condition. My mind, however, was perfectly clear. I postulated quite unreservedly that nothing supernatural could happen and to pass the time, I began to string some rhymes together, in Goldsby fashion, of the original legend of the place. A few I spoke out loud, but the echoes were not pleasant. For the same reason, I also abandoned, after a time, a conversation with myself upon the impossibility of ghosts and haunting. My mind reverted to the three old and distorted people downstairs, and I tried to keep it upon that topic. The somber reds and blacks of the room troubled me. Even with seven candles, the place was merely dim. The one in the clove flared in a draught, and the, light, the fire flickering kept the shadows and penumbra perpetually shifting and stirring. Casting about for a remedy, I recalled the candles I had seen in the passage and, with a slight effort, walked out into the moonlight, carrying a candle and leaving the door open and presently returned with as many as ten. These I put in various knickknacks of china with which the room was sparsely adorned, lit and placed where the shadows had lain deepest, some on the floor, some in the window recesses, until at last my seventeen candles were so arranged that not an inch of the room had but the direct light of at least one of them. It occurred to me that when the ghost came I could warn him not to trip over them. The room was now quite brightly illuminated. There is something very cheery and reassuring in these little streaming flames, and snuffing them gave me an occupation and afforded a helpful sense of the passage of time. 
Even with that, however, the brooding expectation of the vigil weighed heavily upon me. It was after midnight that the candle in the clove suddenly went out. The black shadow sprang back to its place there. I did not see the candle go out. I simply turned and saw that the darkness was there, as one might start and see the unexpected passage of a the unexpected presence of a stranger. By Jove, I said aloud, that draught's a strong one. And taking the matches from the table, I walked across the room in a leisurely manner to relight the corner again. My first match would not strike, and as I succeeded with the second, something seemed to blink on the wall before me. I turned my head involuntarily and saw that the two candles on the little table by the fireplace were extinguished. I rose at once to my feet. Odd, I said. Did I do that myself in a flash of absent-mindedness? I walked back, relit one, and as I did so, I saw the candle in the right sconce of one of the mirrors wink and go right out, and almost immediately its companion followed. There was no mistake about it. The flame vanished, as if the wicks had suddenly been dipped between a finger and thumb, leaving the wick neither glowing nor smoking, but black. While I stood gaping, the candle at the foot of the bed went out, and the shadows seemed to take another step towards me. This won't do, said I, and first one and then another candle on the mantel shelf followed. What's up? I cried, the queer high note getting into my voice somehow. At that, the candle on the wardrobe went out, and the one I had relit on the clove followed. Steady on, I said. These candles are wanted, speaking with a half-hysterical facetiousness and scratching away at a match all the while for the mantel candlesticks. My hands trembled so much that twice I missed the rough paper of the matchbox. As the mantel emerged from darkness again, two candles in the remoter end of the window were eclipsed. But with the same match, I also relit the larger mirror candles and those on the floor near the doorway, so that for the moment I seemed to gain on the extinctions. But then in a volley there vanished four lights at once in different corners of the room, and I struck another match in quivering haste and stood hesitating whether to take it. As I stood undecided, an invisible hand seemed to sweep out the two corners on the table. With a cry of terror, I dashed at the clove, then into the corner, then into the window, relighting three, as two more vanished by the fireplace. Then, perceiving a better way, I dropped the matches on the iron-bound deed box in the corner and caught up the bedroom candlestick. With this, I avoided the delay of striking matches, but for all that steady process of extinction went on, and the shadows I feared and fought against returned and crept in upon me. First a step gained on this side of me and then on that. It was like a ragged storm cloud sweeping out the stars. Now and then one returned for a minute and was lost again. I was now almost frantic with the horror of the coming darkness and my self-possession deserted me. I leapt panting and disheveled from candle to candle in a vain struggling against in a vain struggle against that remorseless advance. I bruised myself on the thigh against the table. I sent a chair headlong. I stumbled and fell and whisked the cloth from the table in my fall. My candle rolled away from me, and I snatched another as I rose. Abruptly, this was blown out as I swung it off the table by the wind of my sudden movement, and immediately the two remaining candles followed. But there was st light still in the room, a red light that staved off the shadows from me. A fire! Of course, I could still thrust my candle between the bars and relight it. I turned to where the flames were still dancing between the glowing coals and splashing red reflections upon the furniture, made two steps toward the grate, and incontinently the flames dwindled and vanished. The glow vanished, the reflections rushed together and vanished, and as I thrust the candle between the bars, darkness closed upon me like the shutting of an eye, wrapped about me in a stifling embrace, steeled my vision, sealed my vision, and crushed the last vestiges of reason from my brain. The candle Don't fell from my hand. The candle fell from my hand. I flung out my arms in a vain effort to thrust that ponderous blackness away from me, and, lifting up my voice, screamed with my might once, twice, thrice. Then, I think I must have staggered to my feet. I know I thought suddenly of the moonlit corridor, the moonlit corridor, and with my head bowed and my arms over my face, I made a run for the door. But I had forgotten the exact position of the door and struck myself heavily against the corner of the bed. I staggered back turned and was either struck or struck myself against some other bulky furniture. I have a vague memory of battering myself thus to and fro in the darkness, of a cramped struggle, and of my own wild crying as I darted to and fro of a heavy blow at last upon my forehead. A horrible sensation of falling that lasted an age, of my frantic effort to keep my footing, and then I remember no more.
I opened my eyes in daylight. My head was roughly bandaged, and the man with the withered arm was watching my face. I looked about me, trying to remember what had happened, and for a space I could not recollect. I rolled my eyes into the corner and saw the old woman. I saw the old woman, no longer abstracted, pouring out some drops of medicine from a little blue phial into a glass. Where am I? I asked. I seem to remember you, and yet I cannot remember who you are. They told me then, and I heard of the haunted red room as one who hears a tale. I found you at dawn, said he, and there was blood on your forehead and lips. It was very slowly that I recovered my memory of my experience. You believe now, said the old man, that the room is haunted? He spoke no longer as one who greets an intruder, but as one who grieves for a broken friend. Yes, said I. The room is haunted. And you have seen it. And we who have lived here all our lives have never set eyes upon it, because we have never dared. Tell us, is it truly the old Earl who... No, said I, it is not. I told you so, said the old lady with the glass in her hand. It is his poor young countess who was frightened. It is not, I said. There is neither ghost of Earl... Earl, nor ghost of countess in that room, there's no ghost there at all, but worse. Far worse. Well, they said. The worst of all things that haunt poor mortal man, said I, and that is, in all its nakedness, fear that will not have light nor sound, that will not bear with reason, that deafens and darkens and overwhelms. It followed me through the corridor. It fought against me in the room. I stopped abruptly. There was an interval of silence. My hand went up to my bandages. Then the man with the shade sighed and spoke. That it is, said he. I knew that it was. A power of darkness. To put such a curse upon a woman, it looks there always. You can feel it even in the daytime, even of a bright summer's day. The hangings and the curtains, keeping behind you however you face it. In the dusk it creeps along the corridor and follows you, so that you dare not turn. There is fear in that room of hers. Black fear, and there will be so long as this house of sin endures. Uh, welcome readers, hello. Welcome to stream. We're reading spooky stories. That was a great finish. That was a good one. That was a good one. That reads really well for an early 1900s written, well, late 1800s written horror story. That's a good one. Omi and Amari. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> and I have Hydrate Redeems because that's the only one I left available for you. So I'm hydrating you out. That's a really good one. That is a really good one. I like that one. Want to add some creepy? Oh yeah, I, I already read creepy pastas. So he got scared by candles going out and hid himself on some furniture. Oh, he got scared by mysteriously candles that should not have gone out. Going out. That's what happened there. So, what we can take away from this is that the two older people thought... Wonderful story voice. Thank you. The two, so we have the t we have the three old people, right? We have the man with the withered arm, we have the man with the shade, and then we have the old woman. The man with the withered arm thought that it was the ghost of the count. The man with the withered arm thought it was the ghost of the countess. But in fact, it is a curse of darkness upon the room. Thank you, Silver and Yan. <laughs> Thank you, Silver and Yan. Thank you very much, everybody, for those hydrates. Hydrating now. Also, Lark, thank you for two months. That one was good. I like that one a lot. Do not trust in suspect candles, Nyan. True, Nyan. True, Nyan. A good one. Music of Eric Zand by Lovecraft is decent. Okay. We did read one Lovecraft one. Here, we have a Mark Twain one that we can read, Yun. A Mark Twain one. There we go, Nyan. Another, another. Okay, okay. The expressionless great piece. 
So I can look at it maybe next. Maybe next, Nyan? In a sec, let's see. Just see if I can find it, Nyan. This is a very short one, Yan. We can do this one before. Before Mark Twain. So ignore the Mark Twain, Yan. We'll do the expressionless first because this is a very short one, Yan. Okay, Nyan. You ready, Nyan? In June 1972, a woman appeared in Cedar Senai Hospital in Los Angeles, California, in nothing but a white blood covered gown, Yan. Now, this in itself should not be too surprising, as people have often had accidents nearby and come to the nearest hospital for medical attention. But there were two things that caused people who saw her to vomit in flee in terror, Nyan. The first being that she wasn't exactly human. She resembled something close to a mannequin, but had the dexterity and fluidity of a normal human being, Nyan. Her face was as flawless as mannequins, devoid of eyebrows and smeared in makeup, Nyan. There was a kitten clamped in her jaws so unnaturally tight that no teeth could be seen, and the blood was still squirting out from over her gown and onto the floor, Nyan. She then pulled it out of her mouth, tossed it aside, and collapsed, Nyan. From the moment she stepped through the entrance to when she was taken to a hospital room and cleaned up before being prepped for sedation, she was completely calm, expressionless and motionless, Nyan. Doctors thought it best to restrain her until the authorities could arrive. She did not protest, Nyan. They were unable to get any kind of response from her, and most staff members felt too uncomfortable to look directly at her for more than a few se seconds, Nyan. But the second the staff tried to sedate her, she fought back with extreme force. Nyan. <laughs> Two members of staff had to hold her down as her body rose up on the bed with that same blank expression. She turned her emotionless eyes towards the male doctor and did something unusual. She smiled. And As she did, the female's doctors screamed and let go with, out of shock. In the woman's mouth were not human teeth, but long, sharp spikes, Nyan. Too long for her mouth to close fully without causing any damage, Nyan. The male doctor stared back at her for a moment before asking, What in the heck are you, Nyan? She cracked her neck down to her shoulder to observe him, still smiling, Nyan. There was a long pause. The security had been alerted and could be heard coming down the hallway, Nyan. As he heard them approach, she darted forward, sinking her teeth into the front of his throat, ripping out his jugular and letting him fall to the floor, gasping for air as he choked on his own blood, Nyan. She stood up and leaned over him, her face coming dangerously close to his as, his life as the life faded from his eyes, Nyan. She leaned closer whispered in his ear, I am God. The doctor's eyes were filled with fear as he watched her calmly walk away to greet the security men. His last ever sight would be watching her feast on them one by one. A female doctor who survived the incident named her the expressionless Nyan. There was never a sighting of her again. It's actually Dio. It's actually Dio, Nyan. I'm, I am God, Nyan. I am God, Nyan. <laughs> Best day I've ever done. I'm glad you enjoy. I'm glad you enjoy the Nyan, Nyan. <laughs> vibe do Nyan does change the vibe a little bit. I am God, Nyan. There you go, Nyan. <laughs> it's slightly less spooky through the use of Nyan. Just a little bit, Nyan. There before? It's always interesting when there's a horror story and it, like... Uses somewhere that you know, right, Nyan? I am God. Nyan! <laughs> Nyan, Nyan! Alright, there we go. Mark Twain, Nyan. Oh, this is a regular mannequin, but it was me, Dio, Nyan. True! Malicious, thank you very much for the gifts of Nyan. The edgy kid on the playground, she really is, Nyan. She really is. I wonder if I can adjust this one. Yeah, that's just gonna be- it's gonna be slightly loud when the alarm goes off. I apologize in advance, Nyan. Website from 2005. 
Just a little bit. Just a little bit, Nyan. Classic horror stories right here, Nyan. Didn't know Mark Twain wrote in horror. Just a couple, Nyan. Just a couple of them. Alright. A ghost story by Mark Twain. I took a large room far up Broadway in an old building whose upper stories had been wholly unoccupied for years until I came, Nyan. The place had long been given up to dust and cobwebs to solitude and silence, Nyan. I seemed groping among the tombs and invading the privacy of the dead. That first night I climbed up to my quarters, Nyan. For the first time in my life, a superstitious dread came over me, and as I turned a dark angle of the stairway, and an invisible cobweb swung its lazy, its lazy woof in my face and clung there, I shuddered as one who had encountered a phantom yun. I was glad enough when I reached my room and locked out the mold and the darkness, Nyan. A cheery fire was burning in the grate, and I sat down before it with a comforting sense of relief, Nyan. For two hours I sat there, thinking of bygone times, recalling old scenes and summoning half-forgotten faces out of the mists of the past, listening, in fancy, to voices that long ago grew silent for all time, and to once familiar songs that nobody sings now, Nyan. And as my reverie softened down to a sadder and sadder pathos. The shrieking of the winds outside softened to a wail, the angry beating of the rain against the panes diminished to a tranquil patter, and one by one the noises in the streets subsided until the hurrying footsteps of the last belated straggler died away in the distance and left no sound behind Nyan. The fire had burned low. A sense of loneliness crept over me, Nyan. I arose and undressed, moving on tiptoe about the room, doing stealthily what I had to do, as if I were environed by sleeping enemies whose slumbers it would be to fatal to break, Nyan. I covered up in bed and lay listening to the rain and wind and the faint creaking of distant shutters till they all they lulled to sleep, Nyan. I slept profoundly, but how long I do not know, Nyan. All at once I found myself awake and filled with a shuddering expectancy, Nyan. All was still, Nyan. All but my own heart, I could hear it beat. Presently, the bedclothes began to slip away slowly toward the foot of the bed as if someone were pulling them, Nyan. I could not stir, I could not speak, Nyan. Still, the blanket slipped deliberately away till my breast was uncovered, Nyan. Then, with a great effort, I seized them and drew them over my head, Nyan. I waited, listened, waited, Nyan. Once more, that steady pull began, and once more I lay torpid in a century of dragging seconds till my breast was naked again, Nyan. At last I roused my energies and snatched the covers back to their place and held them with a strong grip, Nyan. I waited, Nyan. By and by I felt a faint tug, took a fresh grip, Nyan. The tug strengthened to a steady strain, it grew stronger and stronger, Nyan. My hold parted, and for the third time the blanket slid away. I groaned, Nyan. An answering groan came from the foot of the bed, Nyan. Heated drops of sweat stood upon my forehead, Nyan. I was more dead than alive, Nyan. Presently, I heard a heavy footstep in my room. The step of an elephant, it seemed to me. It was not like anything human, Nyan. But it was moving from me. There was relief in that, Nyan. I heard it approach the door, pass without moving, moving bolt or lock, and wander away among the dismal corridors, straining the floors and joists till they creaked again as it passed. Then the silence reigned once more, Nyan. When my excitement had calmed, I said to myself, this is a dream, simply a hideous dream. And so I lay thinking it over until I convinced myself it was a dream. And then a comforting laugh relaxed my lips and I was happy again, Nyan. I got up and struck a light. And when I found that the locks and bolts were just as I had left them, another soothing laugh welled in my heart and rippled from my lips, Nyan. I took my pipe and lit it and was just sitting down before the fire when... Down went the pipe out of my nerveless fingers. The blood forsook my cheeks, and my placid breathing was shut, cut short with a gasp, Nyan. And the ashes on the hearth, side by side with my own bare footprint, was another. So vast in comparison, mine was but an infant's. Then I had had a visitor, and the elephant tread was explained, Nyan. I put out the light and returned to bed, palsied with fear, Nyan. I lay a long time, peering into the darkness and listening. Then I heard a grating noise overhead, like the dragging of a heavy body across the floor. 
Then the throwing down of the body and the shaking of my windows in response to the concussion gun. In distant parts of the building, I heard... Did I not activate neon time again? I didn't. Well, it's completed now. It's been 10 minutes, Neon. <laughs> it's been 10 minutes, Neon. Safe, Neon. In distant parts of the building, I heard the muffled slamming of doors. I heard, at intervals, stealthy footsteps creeping in and out among the corridors and up and down the stairs. Sometimes these noises approached my door, hesitated, and went away again. I heard the clanking of chains faintly in remote passages and listened while the clanking grew nearer, while it wearily climbed the stairways marking each move by the loose surplus of chain that fell with an accented rattle upon each succeeding step as the goblin that bore it advanced. I heard muttered sentences, half-uttered screams that seemed smothered violently, and the swish of invisible garments, the rush of invisible wings. Then I became conscious that my chamber was invaded, that I was not alone. I heard sighs and breathings about my bed and mysterious whisperings. Three little spheres of soft phosphorescent light appeared on the ceiling directly over my head, clung and glowed there a moment, and then dropped, two of them upon my face and one upon my pillow. They spattered liquidly and fell, felt warm. Intuition told me that they had turned to gouts of blood as they fell. I needed no light to satisfy myself of that. Then I saw pallid faces, dimly luminous in white uplifted hands, floating bodiless in the air, floating a moment and then disappearing. The whispering ceased. The sound, voices and the sounds, and a solemn stillness followed. I waited and listened. I felt that I must have light or die. I was weak with fear. I slowly raised myself forward, a sitting posture, and my face came in contact with a clammy hand. All the strength went from me, apparently, and I fell back like a stricken invalid. Then I heard the rustle of a garment. It seemed to pass the door and go out. When everything was still once more, I crept out of bed, sick and feeble, and lit the gas with a hand that trembled as if it were aged with a hundred years. The light brought some little cheer to my spirits. I sat down and fell into a dreamy contemplation of that great footprint in the ashes. By and by, its outlines began to waver and grow dim. I glanced up and the broad gas flame was slowly wilting away. The same moment, I heard that elephantine tread again. I noted its approach nearer and nearer, along the musty halls, and dimmer and dimmer the light waned. The tread reached my very door and paused. The light had dwindled to a sickly blue, and all things about me lay in a spectral twilight. The door did not open, and yet I felt a faint gust of air fan my cheek and presently was conscious of a huge cloudy presence over me. I watched it with a fascinated eyes. A pale glow stole over the thing. Gradually, its cloudy folds took shape. An arm appeared, then legs, then a body, and last, a sad, a great sad face looked out of the vapor, stripped of its fil filmy housings, naked, muscular, and comely. The majestic Cardiff giant looped over me. Why is it nobody but you? Do you know, I have been scared to death for the last two or three hours? I am most honestly glad to see you. I wish I had a chair. Here, here. Don't try to sit down in that thing. But it was too late. He was in it before I could stop him, and down he went. I never saw a chair shivered so in my life. Stop, stop, you'll ruin it. Too late again. There was another crash, and another chair that was resolved to its original elements. Confound it. Have you any judgment at all? Do you want to ruin all the furniture on the place? Here, here, you petrified fool. But it was no use. Before I could arrest him, he had sat down on the bed, and it was a melancholy ruined. Now, what sort of way is that to do? First, you come lumbering about the place, bringing a legion of vagabond goblins along with you to worry me to death. And then when I overlook an indelicacy of costume, which would not be tolerated anywhere by cultivated people, except in a respectable theater, and not even there if the nudity were of your sex, you repay me by wrecking all the furniture you can find to sit down on. And why will you? You damage yourself as much as you do me. You have broken off the end of your spinal column and littered up the floor with chips of your hams till the place looked like a marble yard. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You are big enough to know better. Well, I will not break any more furniture, but what am I to do? I have not had a chance to sit down for a century. And the tears came to his eyes. 
Poor devil, I said. I should not have been so harsh with you. And you are an orphan too, no doubt, but sit down on the floor here, nothing else can stand your weight, and besides, we cannot be sociable with you away up there above me. I want you to be down I want you down where I can perch on this high counting house stool and gossip with you face to face. So he sat down on the floor and lit a pipe which I gave him, threw one of my red blankets over his shoulders, inverted my sits bath on his head, helmet fashion, and made himself picturesque and comfortable. Then he crossed his ankles while I renewed the fire and exposed the flat honeycombed bottoms of his prodigious feet to the grateful warmth. What is the matter with the bottom of your feet and the back of your legs that they are gouged up so? Infernal chilblains, I caught them clear up to the back of my head roosting out there in under Newell's farm. But I love the place. I love it as one loves his old home. There is no peace for me like the peace I feel when I am there. We talked along for an, half an hour and then I noticed that he looked tired and spoke of it. Tired, he said? Well, I should think so. And now I will tell you all about it, since you have treated me so well. I am the spirit of the petrified man that lies across the street there in the museum. I am the ghost of that Cardiff giant. I can have no rest, no peace, till they have given that poor body burial again. Now what was the most natural thing for me to do to make men satisfy that wish? Terrify them into it. Haunt the place where the body lay. So I haunted the museum night after night. I even got other spirits to help me. But it did no good, for nobody ever came to the museum at midnight. Then it occurred to me to come over the way and haunt this place a little. I felt that if I ever got a hearing, I must succeed, for I had the most efficient company that perdition could furnish. Night after night, we have shivered around these mildewed halls, dragging chains, groaning, whispering, tramping up and down stairs, till, to tell you the truth, I am almost worn out. But when I saw a light in your room tonight, I roused my energies again and went out a deal of the old freshness. But I am tired out. Give me, I beseech you, give me some hope. I lit off my perch in a burst of excitement and explained, This transcends everything, everything you ever that ever did occur. Why, you poor, poor blundering old fossil. Have you had all your trouble for nothing? You have been haunting a plaster cast of yourself. The real card of giant is in Albany. Confound it, don't you know your own remains? I never saw such an eloquent look of shame, of pitiable humiliation, overspread a countenance before him. The petrified man rose slowly to his feet and said, Honestly, is that true? As true as I am sitting here. He took the pipe from his mouth and laid it on the mantel, then stood irresolute for a moment, unconsciously from old habit, thrusting his hands where his pantaloon pockets should have been and meditatively dropping his chin on his breast, and finally said, well, I never felt so absurd before. Petrified man has sold everybody else, and now the mean fraud has ended by selling its own ghost. My son, if there is any charity left in your heart for a poor, friendless phantom like me, don't let this get out. Think of how you would feel if you had made such... <laughs> such an ass of yourself. I heard this stately tramp die away step by step down the stairs and out into the deserted street and felt sorry that he was gone, poor fellow, and sorrier still that he had carried off my red blanket and my bathtub. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Thank you for the hydra hydrating meow. <laughs> the giant was wearing the bathtub on its head. Oh, the poor giant. <laughs> That's so on brand for Mark Twain, right? <laughs> right? Oh, that poor... That poor giant. Poor giant. <laughs> Too spooky. The ghost really said, let's just keep it between us, okay? And then Mark Twain goes and writes a story about it. good one it was like what about horror but funny what about some scp i don't know which ones are good ones to read oh 
Spooky story time. It is spooky story time. Actually, I want to see if... How would you like a Japanese one? How would you like a Japanese one? Before we start on this one, actually. This one, so there is a horror author. So when you read the name, you might not realize as you read it. But there was a Japanese author that took a pen name that was Edogawa Ranpo, which sounds oddly, oddly similar to Edgar Allan Poe. So, Edogawa Ranpo was the, uh, Thanks for two month DM. I love when I can cath your streams. Thank you, girl. Lock for two months. It'll go out run for. There you go. All right. So we'll read this one. This is one that I have read before, which is so wonderfully called Ingen Isu, which translates to a human chair. Yoshiko saw her husband off to work at the foreign office a little past 10 o'clock. Then, now that her time was once again her very own, she shut herself up in the study she shared with her husband to resume work on the story she was to submit for the special summer issue of K Magazine. She was a versatile writer with a high literary talent and a smooth flowing style. Even her husband's popularity as a diplomat was overshadowed by hers as an authoress. Daily, she was overwhelmed with letters from readers praising her works. In fact, this very morning, as soon as she sat down before her desk, she immediately proceeded to glance through the numerous letters which the morning mail had brought. Without exception, in content they all followed the same pattern, but prompted by her deep feminine sense of consideration, she always read through each piece of correspondence addressed to her, whether monoton monotonous or interesting. Taking the short and simple letters first, she quickly noted their contents. Finally, she came to one which was a bulky manuscript-like sh manuscript sheaf of pages. Although she had not received any advance notice that a manuscript was to be sent to her, still it was not uncommon for her to receive the efforts of amateur writers seeking her valuable criticism. In most cases, these were long-winded, pointless, and yawn-provoking attempts at writing. Nevertheless, she now opened the envelope in her hand and took out the numerous closely written sheets. As she had anticipated, it was a manuscript, carefully bound. But somehow, for some unknown reason, there was neither title nor byline. The manuscript began abruptly. Dear Madam. Momentarily, she reflected. Maybe after all, it was just a letter. Unconsciously, her eyes hurried on to read two or three lines, and then gradually she became absorbed in a strangely gruesome narrative. The curiosity aroused to the bursting point, and spurred on by some unknown magnetic force, she continued to read. Dear Madam, I do hope you will forgive this presumptuous letter from a complete stranger. What I am about to write, Madam, may shock you to no end. However, I am determined to lay bare before you a confession, my own and to describe in detail the terrible crime I have committed. For many months, I have hidden myself away from the light of civilization, hidden, as it were, like the devil himself. In the whole wide world, no one knows of my deeds. However, quite recently, a clear change took place in my conscious mind, and I just couldn't bear to keep my secret any longer. I simply had to confess. All that I have written so far must certainly have awakened only perplexity in your mind. However, I beseech you to bear with me and kindly read my communication to the bitter end, because if you do, you will fully understand the strange workings of my mind and the reason why it is to you in particular that I make this confession. I am really at a loss as to where to begin, for the facts which I am setting forth are also grotesquely out of the ordinary. 
Frankly, words fail me, for human words seem utterly inadequate to sketch all the details. But nevertheless, I will try to lay bare the events in chronological order, just as they happened. First, let me explain that I am ugly beyond description. Please bear this fact in mind, otherwise I fear that if and when you do grant my ultimate request and do see me, you may be shocked and horrified at the sight of my face after so many months of unsanitary living. However, I implore you to believe me when I state that despite the extreme ugliness of my face within my heart, there has always burned a pure and overwhelming passion. Next, let me explain that I am a humble workman by trade. Had I been born in a well-to-do family, I might have found the power, the money, to ease the torture of my soul brought on by my ugliness. Or, perhaps, if I had been endowed by nature with artistic talents, I might again have been able to forget my bestial countenance and seek consol consolation in music or poetry. But, unblessed with any such talents and being the unfortunate creature that I am, I had no trade to turn to except that of a humble cabinet maker. Eventually, my specialty, be specialty became that of making assorted types of chairs. In this particular line, I was fairly successful, to uh, such a degree, in fact, that I gained the reputation of being able to satisfy any kind of order, no matter how complicated. For this reason, in woodworking circles, I came to enjoy the special privilege of accepting only orders for luxury chairs with complicated requests. For unique carvings, new seats, new designs for the backrest and arm supports, fancy padding for the cushions and seat, all work of a nature which call for skilled hands and patient trial and study, work which an amateur craftsman could hardly undertake. The reward for all my pains, however, lay in the sheer delight of creating. You may consider me a braggart when you hear this, but it all seemed to me to be the same type of thrill which a true artist feels upon creating a masterpiece. As soon as a chair was completed, it was one of it was my usual custom sit on it to sit on it to see how it felt, and despite the dismal life of one of my humble profession, at such moments I experienced an indescribable thrill. Giving my mind free rein, I used to imagine the types of people who would eventually curl up in the chair, certainly people of nobility, living in palatial residences with exquisite priceless paintings hanging on the walls, glittering crystal chandeliers hanging from the ceilings, expensive rugs on the floor, etc., and one particular tray, chair, which I imagined standing before a mahogany table, gave me the vision of fragrant western flowers scenting the air with sweet perfume. Enwrapped in these strange visions, I came to feel that I too belong to such settings, and I derived no end of pleasure. And I derived no end of pleasure from imagining myself to be an influential figure in society. Foolish thoughts such as these keep coming to me in a rapid kept coming to me in rapid succession. Imagine, madam, the pathetic figure I made sitting comfortably in a luxurious chair of my own making and pretending I was holding hands with the girl of my dreams. As was always the case, however, the noisy chattering of the uncouth woman of the neighborhood and the hysterical shrieking, babbling, and wailing of the children quickly dispelled all my beautiful dreams. Again, grim reality reared its ugly head before my eyes. Once back to earth again, I found myself a miserable creature, a helpless crawling worm. As, and as for my beloved, that angelic woman, she too vanished like a mist. I cursed myself for my folly. Why even the dirty woman tending bar babies in the streets did not so much bother to glance in my di direction. Every time I completed a new chair, I was haunted by feelings of utter despair. And with the passing of the months, my long accumulated misery was enough to choke me. One day, I was charged with the task of making a huge leather-covered armchair of a type I had never before conceived for a foreign hotel located in Yokohama. Actually, this particular type of chair was to have been imported from abroad, but through the persuasion of my employer, who admired my skill as a chair maker, I received the order. In order to live up to my reputation as a super craftsman, I began to devote myself seriously to my new assignment. Steadily, I became so engrossed in my labors that at times I even skipped food and sleep. Really, it would be no exaggeration to state that the job became my very life, every fiber of the wood I used seemingly linked to my heart and soul. At last, when the chair was completed, I experienced the satisfaction hitherto unknown, for I honestly believed I had achieved a piece of work which immeasurably surpassed all of my other creations. As before, I rested the weight of my body on the four legs that supported the chair, first dragging it to a sunny spot on the porch of my workshop. What comfort, what supreme luxury, not too hard or too soft, 
The springs seemed to match the cushion with uncanny precision. And for the as for the leather, what an alluring touch it possessed. This chair was not this chair not only supported the person who sat in it, but also seemed to embrace and to hug him. Still further, I noted the perfect reclining angle of the back support, the delicate puffy swelling of the armrests, the perfect symmetry of each of the component parts. Surely no product could have expressed the greater eloquence of the definition of the word comfort. I let my body sink deeply into the chair and, caressing the two armrests with my hands, gasped with genuine satisfaction and pleasure. Again, my imagination began to play its usual tricks, raising strange fancies in my mind. The scene which I imagined now rose before my eyes so vividly that for a moment I asked myself if I were not slowly going insane. While in this mental condition, a weird idea suddenly leapt to my mind. Assuredly, it was the whispering of the devil himself. Although it was a sinister idea, it attracted me with a powerful magnetism which I found impossible to resist. At first, no doubt, the idea found its seed in my secret yearning to keep the chair for myself. Realizing, however, that this was totally out of the question, I next longed to accompany the chair wherever it went. Slowly but steadily, as I continued to nurse this fan fantastic notion, my mind fell into the grip of an almost terrifying temptation. Imagine, madam. I really and actually made up my mind to carry out that awful scheme to the end, come what may. Quickly, I took the armchair apart and then put it together again to suit my weird purposes. As it was a large armchair with the seat covered right down to the level of the floor, and furthermore, as the backrest and arm supports were all large in dimensions, I soon contrived to make the cavity inside large enough to accommodate a man without any danger of exposure. Of course, my work was hampered by the large amount of wooden framework and the springs inside, but with my usual skills as a craftsman, I remodeled the chair so that the knees could be placed below the seat, the torso and the head inside the backrest. Seated thus in the cavity, one could remain perfectly concealed. As this type of craftsmanship came as a second nature to me, I also added a few finishing touches, such as improved acoustics to catch outside noises, and of course, a peephole cut out in the leather but absolutely unnoticeable. Furthermore, I provided storage space for supplies, wherein I placed a few boxes of hardtack and a water bottle. For another nature's needs, I also inserted a large rubber bag, and by the time I finished fitting the interior of the chair with these and other unique facilities, it had become quite a habitable place. But not for longer than two or three days at a stretch. Completing my weird task, I stripped down to my waist and buried myself inside the chair. Just imagine the strange feeling I experienced, madam. Really, I felt at that I had buried myself in a lonely grave. Upon careful reflection, I realized that it was indeed a grave. As soon as I entered the chair, I was swallowed up by complete darkness, and to everyone else in the world, I no longer existed. Presently, a messenger arrived from the dealer to take the delivery of the armchair, bringing with him a large handcart. My apprentice, the only person with whom I lived, was utterly unaware of what had happened. I saw him talking to the messenger. While the chair was being loaded into the handcart, one of the cart pullers exclaimed, Good God, this chair certainly is heavy. It must weigh a ton. When I heard this, my heart leapt to my mouth. However, as the chair itself was obviously an extraordinarily heavy one, no suspicions were aroused, and before long, I could feel the vibration of the rattling handcart being pulled along the streets. Of course, I, of course, I worried incessantly, but at length, that same afternoon, the armchair in which I was concealed was placed with a thud on the floor of a room in the hotel. Later, I discovered that it was not an ordinary room, but the lobby. Now, as you may have already guessed long ago, my key motive in this mad venture was to leave my hole in the chair when the coast was clear, loiter around the hotel, and start stealing. Who would dream that a man was concealed inside a chair? Like a fleeting shadow, I could ransack every room at will, and by the time any alarm sounded, I would be safe and sound inside my sanctuary, holding my breath and observing the ridiculous antics of the people outside looking for me. Possibly you have heard of the hermit crab that is so often found on coastal rocks. Shaped like a large spider, the crab crawls about stealthily and, as soon as it hears footsteps, quickly retreats into an empty shell, from which hiding place with gruesome hairy front legs partially exposed, it looks furtively about. I was just like this freak monster crab, but instead of a shell, I had a better shield, a chair, which could conceal me far more effectively. As you can imagine, my plan was so unusual and original, so utterly unexpected, that no one was ever the wiser. 
Consequently, my adventure was com a complete success. On the third day after my arrival at the hotel, I discovered that I had already taken in quite a haul. Imagine the thrill and excitement of being able to rob to my heart's content, not to mention the fun I derived from observing the people rushing, rushing hither and thither only a few inches away from under my very nose shouting, the thief went this way and he went that way. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to describe all my experiences to you in detail. Rather, allow me to proceed with my narrative and tell you of a far greater source of weird joy which I managed to discover. In fact, what I'm about to relate to you, relate now is the key point of this letter. First, however, I must request that you turn your thoughts back to the moment when my chair and I were both placed in the lobby of the hotel. As soon as the chair was put on the floor, all the various members of the staff took turns testing out the seat. After the novelty wore off, they all left the room and then silence reigned absolute and complete. However, I could not find the courage to leave my sanctum, for I began to imagine a thousand dangers. For what seemed like ages, I kept my ears alerted for the sil slightest sound. After a while, I heard heavy footsteps drawing near, evidently from the direction of the corridor. The next moment, the unknown feet must have started to tread on a heavy carpet for the walking sound died out completely. Some time later, the sound of a man panting, all out of breath, assailed my ears. Before I could anticipate what the next development would be, a large, heavy body like that of a European fell on my knees and seemed to bounce two or three times before settling down. With just a thin layer of leather between the seat of his trousers and my knees, I could almost feel the warmth of his body. As for his broad, muscular shoulders, they rested flatly against my chest, while his two heavy arms were deposited squarely on mine. I could imagine this individual puffing away at his cigar, for the strong aroma came floating to my nostrils. Just imagine yourself in my queer position, madam, and reflect for a brief moment on the utterly unnatural state of affairs. As for myself, however, I was utterly frightened, petrified with cold sweat running down my armpits. Beginning with this individual, several people sat on my knees that day, as if they had patiently awaited their turn. No one, however, suspected, even for a fleeting moment, that the soft cushion on which they were sitting was actually human flesh with blood circulating in its veins, confined in a strange world of darkness. What was it about this mystic hole that fascinated me so? I somehow felt like an animal living in a totally new world. And as for the people who lived in the world outside, I could distinguish on them only as people who made weird noises, breathed heavily, talked, rustled their clothes, and possessed soft, round bodies. Gradually, I could distinguish the sitters just by the sense of touch rather than of sight. Those who were fat felt like large jellyfish, while those who were th especially thin made me feel like I was supporting a skeleton. Other distinguishing factors consisted of this curve of the spine, the breadth of the shoulder blades, the length of the arms, and the thickness of their thighs, as well as the contour of their bottoms. It may seem strange, but I speak nothing but the truth when I say that although all people may seem alike, there are countless distinguishing traits among all men which can be seen merely by the feel of their bodies. In fact, there are just as many differences as the case of fingerprints or facial contours. This theory, of course, also applies to female bodies. Usually, women are custom classified in two large categories, the plain and the beautiful. However, in my dark, confined world, inside the chair, facial merits or demerits were of secondary importance, being overshadowed by the more meaningful qualities found in the feel of flesh, the sound of the voice and body odor. Madam, I do hope you will not be offended by the boldness with which I sometimes speak. And so, to continue with my narration, there was one girl, first who ever sat on me, who kindled in my heart a passionate love. Judging solely by her voice, she was European. At the moment, although there, were no else, there was no one else present in the room, her heart must have been filled with happiness because she was singing with a sweet voice when she came tripping into the room. I soon heard her standing immediately in front of my chair, and without giving any warning, she suddenly burst into laughter. The very next moment, I could hear her flapping her arms like a fish struggling in a net, and then she sat down on me. For a period of about 30 minutes, she continued to sing, moving her body and feet in tempo with the melody. For me, this was quite an unexpected development, for as I'll, I had always held aloof from all members of the opposite sex because of my ugly face. Now I realized that I was present in the same room with a European girl who I had never seen, my skin virtually touching hers through a thin layer of leather. Unaware of my presence, she continued to act with an unreserved freedom, doing as she pleased. Inside the neck, I could visualize myself hugging her, kissing her snowy white neck, if only I could remove that layer of leather. Following this, 
somewhat unhallowed but nevertheless enjoyable experience, I forgot all about my original intentions of committing robbery. Instead, I seemed to be plunging headlong into a new whirlpool of maddening pleasure. Long I pondered. Maybe I was destined to enjoy this type of existence. Gradually, the truth seemed to dawn on me. For those who were as ugly and as shunned as myself, I was as surely wiser to enjoy life inside a chair. For this strange dark world, I could hear and touch all desirable creatures. Love in a chair. This may seem altogether too fantastic. Only one who has actually experienced it will be able to vouch for the thrills and the joys it provides. Of course, it is a strange sort of love, limited to the senses of touch, hearing, and smell, a love burning in the world of darkness. Believe it or not, many of the events that take place in this world are beyond full understanding. In the beginning, I had intended to per only perpetuate a series of robberies and then flee. Now, however, I became so attached to my quarters that I adjusted to them more and more to permanent living. In my nocturnal prowlings, I always took the greatest of precautions, watching each step I took, hardly making a sound. Hence, there was little danger of being detected. When I recall, however, that I spent several months inside the chair without being discovered even once, it e indeed surprises even me. For the better part of each day, I remained inside the chair, sitting like a contortionist with my arms folded and spent. As a consequence, I felt as if my whole body were paralyzed. Furthermore, I could never stand up straight. My muscles became taut and inflexible, and gradually I began to crawl instead of walk to the washroom. What a madman I was. Even in the face of all these sufferings, I could not persuade myself to abandon my folly and leave that world, weird world of sensuous pleasure. In the hotel, although there were several guests who stayed for a month or two, even two, making the place their home, there were always a constant inflow of new guests and an equal exodus of the old. As a result, I could never manage to enjoy a permanent love. Even now, as I bring to mind all my love affairs, I can recall nothing but the touch of warm flesh. Some of the women possessed the firm bodies of ponies, others seemed to have slimy bodies of snakes, and still others had bodies composed of nothing but fat, giving them the bounce of a rubber ball. There were, even, there were also the unusual exceptions of those who seemed to have bodies made only of sheer muscle, like artistic Greek statues. But notwithstanding the types or species, species or types, one and all had a special magnetic allure quite distinctive from the others, and I was perpetually shifting the object of my passions. At one time, for example, an internationally famous dancer came to Japan and happened to stay at the same hotel. Although she sat in my chair only one on one single occasion, the contact of her smooth, soft flesh against my own afforded me hitherto unknown thrill. So divine was the touch of her body that I felt inspired to a state of positive exultation. On this occasion, instead of my carnal instincts being aroused, I simply felt like a gifted artist being caressed by the magic wand of a fairy. Strange, eerie episodes followed in rapid succession. However, as space prohibits, I shall refrain from giving a detailed description of each and every case. Instead, I shall continue to outline the general course of events. One day, several months following my arrival at the hotel, there suddenly occurred an unexpected change in the shape of my destiny. For some reason, the foreign proprietor of the hotel was forced to leave for his homeland, and as a result, the management was transferred to Japanese hands. Originating from this chain of proprietorship, a new policy was adopted calling for a drastic retrenchment in expenditures, the abolishment of luxurious fittings, and other steps to increase profits through economy. One of the first results of this new policy was that the management put all of the extravagant furnishings of the hotel up for auction. Included in the list of items for sale was my chair. When I learned of this new development, I immediately felt the greatest of, greatest of disappointments. Soon, however, a voice inside inside of me advice that I should return to the natural world outside and spend the tidy sum I had acquired by stealing. I, of course, realized that I would no longer have to return to my humble life as a craftsman, for actually I was comparatively wealthy. The thought of my new role in society seemed to overcome my disappointments in having to leave the hotel. Also, when I reflected deeply on all the pleasures which I had derived there, I was forced to admit that although my love affairs had been many, they had all been with foreign women and somehow had always been lacking. I then fully realized fully and deeply that as a Japanese, I really craved the lover of my own kind. While I was turning these thoughts over in my mind, my chair, with me still in it, was sent to a furniture store to be sold at an auction. Maybe this time, I told myself, the chair will be purchased by a Japanese and kept in a Japanese home. With my fingers crossed, I decided to be patient and continue with my existence in the chair a while longer. Although I suffered for two or three days in my chair while it stood in front of the furniture store, eventually it came up for sale and was promptly purchased. This fortunately, because of the excellent workmanship which had gone into its making and although it was no longer new, it still had a dignified bearing. The purchaser was a high-ranking official who lived in Tokyo. 
When I was being transferred from the furniture store to the man's palatial residence, the bouncing and vibrating of the vehicle almost killed me. I gritted my teeth and bore up bravely, however comforted by the thought that at last I had been bought by a Japanese. <laughs> Inside his house, I was placed in a spacious Western-style study. One thing about the room which gave me the greatest satisfactions was that my chair was meant for the use of his young and attractive wife, more than for his own. Within a month, I had come to be with the wife constantly united with her as one, so to speak. With the exception of the dining and sleeping hours, her soft body was always seated on my knees for the simple reason that she was engaged in a deep thinking task. You have no idea how much I loved this lady. She was the first Japanese woman with whom I had ever come into such close contact, and moreover, she possessed a wonderfully appealing body. She seemed to answer all of my prayers. Compared with this, all my other affairs with the various women in the hotel seemed like childish flirtations, nothing more. Proof of the mad love which I now cherished for this intellectual lady was found in the fact that I longed to hold her every moment of the time. When she was away, even for a fleeting moment, I waited for her return, like a love-crazed Romeo, yearning for his Juliet. Such feelings I had never hitherto experienced. Gradually, I came to want to convey my feelings to her, somehow. I tried vainly to carry out my purpose, but always encountered a blank wall where I was absolutely helpless. Oh, how I longed to have her reciprocate my love. Yes, you may consider this the confession of a madman, for I was mad, madly in love with her. How could I signal to her? If I revealed myself, the shock of the discovery would immediately prompt her to call her husband and the servants, and that, of course, would be fatal to me. Her exposure would not only mean disgrace, but severe punishment for the crimes I had committed. I therefore decided on another course of action, namely, to add in every way to her comfort and thus awaken in her a natural love for... The chair. As she was a true artist, I somehow felt confident that her natural love of beauty would guide her in the direction I desired. As for myself, I was willing to find pure contentment for her love even for a material object, for I could find solace in the belief that her delicate feelings of love for even a mere chair were powerful enough to penetrate to the creature that dwelled inside, which was myself. In every way, I endeavored to make her more, more comfortable every time she placed her weight on my chair. Whenever she became tired from sitting long in one position on my humble person, I would slowly move my knees and embrace her more warmly, making her more snug. I would s and when she dozed off to sleep, I would move my knees ever so softly to rock her into deeper slumber. Somehow, possibly my miracle, or was it just my imagination, this lady now seemed to fall seemed to love my chair deeply, for every time she sat down, she acted like a baby falling into a mother's embrace, or a girl surrendering herself to the arms of her lover. And when she moved herself about in the chair, I felt that she was feeling almost amorous joy. In this way, the fire of my love and passion rose to a leaping flame that could never be extinguished. And I finally reached a stage where I simply had to make a strange, bold plea. No doubt, uh, ultimately, I felt that I began to feel that she would just look at me, even if she would just look at me, even for a brief passing moment, I could die with the deepest of contentment. No doubt, madam, by this time you must certainly have guessed who the object of my mad passion is. To put it explicitly, she happens to be no other than yourself, madam. Ever since your husband brought the chair from, my furniture, from that furniture store, I have been suffering excruciating pains because of my mad love and longing for you. I am but a warm worm, a loathsome creature. I have one but, but one request. Could you meet me once? just once. I will ask nothing further of you. I, of course, do not deserve your sympathy, for I have always been nothing but a villain, unworthy to even touch the soles of your feet. But if you will grant me this one request, just out of compassion, my gratitude will be eternal. Last night, I stole out of your residence to write this confession, because even leaving aside the danger, I did not possess the courage to meet you suddenly, face to face, without any warning or preparation. While you are reading this letter, I will be roaming around your house with bated breath. If you will agree to my request, please place your handkerchief on the pot of flowers that stands outside your window. At this signal, I will open your front door and enter as a humble visitor. Thus ended the letter. Even before Yoshiko had read many pages, some premonition of evil had caused her to become deadly pale. Rising unconsciously, she had fled from the study, from that chair upon which she had been seated, and sought sanctuary in one of the Japanese rooms of her house. For a moment, it had been her intention to stop reading and tear up the eerie message, but somehow she had read on with the closely written sheets laid on a low desk. Now that she had finished, her premonition was proved correct. That chair on which she sat from day to day, had it really contained a man? If true, what a horrible experience she had unknowingly undergone. A sudden chill came over her, as if ice water had been poured down her back and the shivers that followed seemed never to stop. Like one in a trance, she gazed into space. Should she examine the chair? 
but how could she possibly steal herself for such a horrible ordeal? Even though the chair might now be empty, what about the filthy remains, such as the food and other necessary items which he must have used? Madam, a letter for you. With a start, she looked up and found her maid standing in the doorway with an envelope in her hand. In a daze, Yoshiko took the envelope and stifled a scream. Horror of horrors. It was another message from the same man. Again, her name was written in that same familiar scrawl. For a long while, she hesitated, wondering whether she should open it. At last, she mustered enough courage to break the seal and shakingly took out the pages. The second communication was both short and curt, and it contained another breathtaking surprise. Forgive my boldness in addressing another message to you. To begin with, I merely happen to be one of your ardent admirers. The manuscript, which I submitted to you under separate cover, was based on pure imagination and my knowledge that you had recently bought that chair. It is a sample of my own humble attempts at fictional writing. If you would kindly comment on it, I shall know no greater satisfaction. For personal reasons, I submitted my MS prior to writing this letter of explanation, and I assume you've already read it. How did you find it? If, madam, you have found it amusing or entertaining in some degree, I shall feel that my literary efforts have not been wasted. Although I purposefully refrain from telling you in the MS, I intend to give my story the title, The Human Chair. With my deepest respect and sincere wishes, I remain cordially yours. Yes, Junji Ito did do a manga based off of this story. Just a prank, bro. <laughs> I'm not actually your chair. <laughs> it's a sample of my works. <laughs> Thank you for the hydrate. Also, Phoebe, thank you so much for the raid. So sorry, I was mid-reading, so I couldn't... Stab chair. <laughs> Catch you next time, catch you next time. Or is it? <laughs> yes, okay, so the final one will do the SCP. If, if the person that recommended the SCP is still there. Um, about the writer suffering, it's all in Japanese, that's so first person. Oh, interesting. Rampo was the OG troll, yes. There's not an anime, but there is a Junji Ito um, about it. Somebody had recommended an SCP. So we'll finish up with an SCP if we have, if we can have one good SCP. <laughs> it's a prank, bro. Ahaha, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Several multiple people. Which one? Oh wait, seven. I just read that one. We haven't read any SCPs yet. I'm gonna read SCP 087. Was it only Junji Ito? Uh, it there was a Junji Ito comic. It's possible there's been other comics based off of it because it is a piece of Japanese like horror literature. So. <laughs> All right, we'll read this SCP and then we'll do head paths and that will be, that will be it on this. Okay, SCP-087, right? Okay, item number SCP-087, object class, listen. Special containment procedures, SCP-087 is located on the campus of Redacted. Doorway leading to SCP-087 is constructed of reinforced steel with an electro-release lock mechanism. It has been disguised to resemble a janitorial closet consistent with the design of the building. The lock mechanism on the doorknob will not be re will not release unless redacted volts are applied in conjunction with the counterclockwise rotation of the key. The key inside of the door is lined with six centimeters of industrial foam padding. Due to the results of the final expiration, see document 87-4, no personnel are permitted access to SCP-087. Description. SCP-087 is an unlit platform staircase. Stairs descend on a 38 degree angle for 13 steps before reaching a semicircular platform of approximately 3 meters in diameter. Descent direction rotates 180 degrees at each platform. 
The design of SCP-087 limits subjects to a visual range of approximately 1.5 flights. A light source is required for any subjects exploring SCP-087 as there are no lighting fixtures or windows present. Lighting sources brighter than 75 watts have been shown to be ineffective as SCP-087 seems to absorb excess light. Subjects report and audio recordings confirm the distressed vocalizations from what is presumed to be a child between the ages of the source of the distress calls is estimated to be located approximately 200 meters below the initial platform. However, any attempts to descend the staircase have failed to bring subjects closer to the source. The depth of descent calculated from Exploration 4, the longest exploration, is shown to be far beyond both possible structure of both the building and geological surroundings. At this time, it is unknown if SCP-087 has an endpoint. SCP-087 has undergone four video-recorded explorations by Class D personnel. Each subject conducting the exploration has encountered SCP-087-1, which appears as a face with no visible pupils, nostrils, or mouth. The nature of SCP-087-1 is entirely unclear, but it has been determined that it is not the source of the bleeding. Subjects exhibit feelings of intense paranoia and fear when faced with SCP-087-1, but it is undetermined whether said feelings are abnormal or simply natural reactions. Addendum. Over a period of two weeks following Exploration 4, several members of the staff and students from the redacted campus reported knocking at a variable rate of 1-2 to two seconds per knock coming from the interior of SCP-087. The door leading to SCP-087 has been fitted with 6 cm thick industrial padding. All reports of knocking have ceased. Authorized personnel may refer to documents 0871 through 0874 for transcri transcripts of Explorations 1-4. through 4. Document 0871, Exploration 1. D-8432 is a 43-year-old Caucasian male of average build and appearance and unremarkable psychological background. Class D designation is a result of demotion due to mishandling SC plea. D-8432 is equipped with a 75-watt flood lamp with a battery power capable of lasting 24 hours, a handheld camcorder fitted with transmission stream, and an audio headset for communication with Dr. Blank at control. D-8432 steps through the doorway onto the initial platform. Despite the wattage, the flood lamp only illuminates the first nine steps. The second platform is not visible. It's heckin' dark. Is your flood lamp proper functioning properly? D-8432 shines the light out of the door into the academic building's hallway. The light reaches significantly further. Yeah, it's working. It just won't light these stairs all the way down. Thank you. Please continue. D-8432 descends for 13 steps before reaching the second platform. The platform is in the shape of a semicircle with an apparently concrete surface and walls. There are no distinct markings aside from nondescript patches of dust, dirt, or wear consistent with that which is found in a typical concrete stairwell. D-8432 rotates 180 degrees to begin descent down the second flight, then pauses. Reason for stopping? Do you hear that? There's a hanging kid down there. Sounds like one. None of the described audio is feeding through the camera or mic at this time. Could you please describe the sound? It's young, either female or a very young boy. It's crying and sobbing and saying, please, help, please. Yeah, it keeps repeating that and crying. Can you estimate its distance from your current location? Uh, heck, I don't know, maybe 200 meters down? Please continue down the next flight. The subject descends another 13 steps. As he reaches the landing, audio of the child is, as described, is picked up. The child alternates between sobbing, wailing, and the words, please, help, and down here. The level of audio is consistent with D8432's report of it being approximately 200 meters below. Can you still hear the crying? Yeah. We're picking it up as well. Please continue down. Stop if you notice any changes in the audio or environment. The subject descends another three flights of stairs before stopping. Keep going? Please. The A432 continues another 17 flights, total of 22 flights before stopping. There are no visual changes in the environment, and each flight has been a consisting 13 steps. I'm not getting any hecking closer to the kid. Stereo audio confirms that the crying noise has not increased in volume and remains approximately 200 meters below the subject. Noted, please continue. The subject continues another 28 flights before stopping, 50 flights total. D-8432 is standing on the 51st landing, counting the initial, initial ground-level landing. 
D-8432 is estimated to be 200 meters below the initial platform. 34 minutes have elapsed. The volume of the crying has not increased. D-8432, I feel a little uneasy. You spent a long time in a dark, unknown stairwell. It's natural. Please continue. The subject hesitates before stepping down on the next stair. As the subject moves forward, the flood lamp illuminates a face approximately at the bottom of the flight. It appears to be the same size and shape as a human head, except it is lacking a mouth, nostrils, and pupils. The face is completely motionless, but is making direct eye contact, indicating its awareness of D-8432. Heck, what the heck is that? Heck, holy hecking heck, what the heck? Can you please describe what you see? It's some sort of hecking face thing, and it's hecking looking right at me. Heck, 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 it's looking right at me. Is it moving? No, it's just staring at me. Heck, 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 it's creepy. Please approach and further eliminate the entity. Heck, 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 I don't want a hecking. The face jerks forward about 50 centimeters directly toward D8432. Heck, 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 heck. D8432 enters a panic state and rapidly ascends SCP-087. D8432 reaches the ground floor in 18 minutes, at which he collapses and passes out. There is no sign of SCP-0871. Reviewing of the footage indicates an equal number of flights and steps ascending as descending. Audio of the crying and pleading remains at the same volume until the last flight, at which point it ceases. Medical reports indicate collapse was a result of rapid ascension of the stairs, causing fatigue. This is long. This is long. <laughs> we'll read the final document, okay? And then we'll call it there. <laughs> we'll read this final one and then we'll call it there, all right? We're gonna skip the middle documentation. I'm assuming another person went down and had, had issues. Because <laughs> the final document data has been expunged, so we can't have odd uh, number four. Okay. D-9884 is a 23-year-old female of average build and appearance. Psychological background indicates a history of depression. Subject has a minimal record of using excessive force to data expunged. D-9884 is equipped with a 75-watt flood lamp with battery power cap capable of lasting 24 hours, a handhold camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset for communicating with doctor at control. D-9884 is also equipped with a backpack containing 3.75 liters of water, 15 nutrient bars, and one thermal blanket. D 9884 stands on the ground level landing of SCP-087. The flood lamp illuminates not illuminates only the first nine steps. LED lights placed on the wall during the last exploration are not visible. Please ascend the first flight and examine the landing wall. D-9884 descends 13 steps and stops at the landing. There is no trace of the LED light at the location of footage from Exploration 2 and it plate. It was placed. Yeah, um, it's just a dirty concrete wall. There's nothing on it. No, wait, it's a little bit sticky right here. D9884 indicates the spot on the wall the LED light should have been located. There's a crying child down here. She's she's begging for help and crying. Thank you. Please continue down the steps until you notice anything unusual. D9884 descends. Upon reaching the next landing, audio of the crying child consistent with the prior two explorations is picked up. No LED lights appear to be present on any of the landing walls. D9884 continues with no incident until she reaches the 17th landing. Ew, there's something on, my, on the ground here and it smells really bad. It's all sticky and stuck to my shoe. Ugh, it's so gross. Video feed confirms presence of substance occupying a space approximately 50 centimeters in diameter. Can you describe the scent? Uh, it kind of smells like old rusty metal and pee. Thank you. Please continue on until you notice anything else. D-9884 continues to the, five, to the 51st landing without incident. The 51st landing remains unchanged from the previous expedition and similar observations are made. D-9884 is asked again to descend until anything unusual is noticed. Subject continues her descent until the 89th landing is reached. The video feed jerks and the subject yells. Ah, heck, there's a hole in the ground and I almost fell in. Video feed confirms the presence of a hole approximately one meter in diameter. The subject shines the floodlight down, revealing only blackness. Approximately four seconds pass, and a light of indeterminate distance down the hole flicks on for approximately two seconds and back down, off. There's a light down there. It's gone now, but it was on for like a second. Did you see it? Yes. Can you estimate the depth of this hole? <laughs> no way, it's too deep. At least a kilometer, like way more than a kilometer. Thank you. Can you still hear the sounds of the child? 
Uh-huh. She still sounds far away. I don't feel like I'm getting any closer. It's like for every step I take, she takes one down. Please continue until you encounter anything unusual. D9884 continues to descend SCP-087 for approximately an hour, covering an additional 164 flights. She stops to rest on the, 50, the 253rd landing, consuming one nutrient bar and several gulps of water. D9884 is at an estimated 1.1 kilometers below the initial landing, yet the sound of the child has not changed in volume. After pausing for four minutes, D9884 resumes her descent, making no stops for another 216 flights. 1.5 hours later, D9884 is on the 469th landing and approximate 1.8 kilometers below ground level. I'm not getting anywhere. I think it's back time I went back. I mean, going down is one thing, but this is a long climb back. You have been provided with food, water, and blankets the last two 24 hours. Please continue down. No, I think I'm going to go back up. D9884 turns toward the previous flight of stairs. I. SCP-087, the face, is directly behind D9884, blocking her ascent. The face appears approximately 30 centimeters from the lens of the camera. Its eyes are fixed directly on the lens, this time not at the, looking not at the subject, but the person viewing the video feed. The video feed glitches and freezes for four seconds, accompanied by a static-like screeching noise from the audio feed. It then cuts to bumpy visuals of D9884 descending the stairs rapidly. It's been following me. This whole time it's been right behind me. Oh god, it's right behind me. It's looking right at me. Doctor, please do something. Please help me. Oh god, no, please get it away. No, please. I knew it was following me. Help it. Make it leave, please. No, it was looking at me. It was staring at me. It knew I was there. It's been watching the whole time. Oh god, please help me. Oh, please. This continues a similar fashion until the end. D889884 continues to scream and plead hysterically as she rapidly descends the staircase. The previously heard static-like screeching seems to overlay the audio feed beneath which can still be heard the original sound of the crying child. Approximately 14 flights down, the video feed swings to show the area directly behind D9884. The face is now approximately 20 centimeters from the camera lens. It is not staring at the subject, rather it is fixated on the camera lens, giving the illusion it is making eye contact with those viewing the footage. It is important to note that since the sighting of SCP D0871, the sound of the girl crying and pleading has been increasing in volume, indicating D9884 is nearing the source. After an approximate 150 panicked flights of descent with three visual confirmations of SCP-0871 still in pursuit, D9884 trips and fall appears to fall unconscious. Audio feed indicates strong proximity to the source of the crying. The static and screeching noise continue. Video feed shows yet another descending flight of stairs, indicating D9884 still has not reached the base of the stairwell. 12 seconds of motionlessness pass before the face comes fully in view of the camera, eye contact being made directly with the viewer. Audio feed and video feed cuts out, and no connection is re-established. And unfortunately, the fourth one has been data expunged, so it looks like we won't be finding out more about the SCP. I think she might have died. She might be dead. She might be dead. Gotta fix the hands. Can I re re recommend another SCP? No, we're finishing up stream now, so. <laughs> Don't give closure to the story. I like the one that learns how to cook and play piano. I like that one. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed. Don't, I don't do the reading types of streams too, too often because it takes a lot of energy to read through stuff. <laughs> and sometimes it winds up being... Sometimes they're slightly weird. Like, I know Edgo, Edogawa Ranpo is slightly weird. He likes to... He definitely likes to dip into, like, that... that uncomfortable realm when he's writing. But I really like his writing, so... These get saved. Yes, I am actually recording this entire VOD and I will upload an edited version to YouTube on it. <laughs> so, we're gonna do head pats, all right? I'm thoroughly spooked. <laughs> we're gonna do head pats right at the end here, okay? It's a weird uncomfortable feel, also so good. It's so good, because you're just like, you're reading and you're like, oh no. He's her chair. <laughs> Is Rompo better in Japanese? I actually haven't read in the original Japanese, so I know 100 because it's broken. Don't worry, I'll do 100. All right, feel free to spam head bats. Well, I at least count to 100. So here we go. 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 
33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 44, 142, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 77, 72, 72, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 100. Yes. Did you not get into Japanese literature in uni? I did, but I did not ever get to the point where my Japanese was good enough to read Edogawa Ranpo in his original writing. I can read middle school level stuff, not Edogawa Ranpo. Thank you for that hydrate. hydrate Hydrate. Done. Don't worry, all the other, uh, the other stuff. I will turn on the commands again tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, there's going to be a collaboration. So we'll start up with that. He's getting me sleep. <laughs> what level is Ronpo? Uh, probably original. So, so much wow. The main thing is finding, uh, finding music that's okay to play without copyright stuff that's also long enough to run for stream is something that makes it difficult, right? I I actually recorded this with separate audio tracks, so I can add horror music into it for the YouTube version, so. Thank you for the best, and thank you everybody who subbed. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But we need to find somebody to raid. It's like somebody here's got their first it's their first playthrough of uh their first time playing dead space shall we raid someone who's on their first time playing dead space i think that's a good idea let's do that accept music tracks from fans to help the, the main thing with that is it's hard to tell if there are people that are able to uh that if they have the full rights to the music, that's the main hard thing, right? I'm gonna raid somebody that's new. <laughs> I haven't raided them before. They're playing Dead Space, so that should be fun. Stomp the babies. Stomp the babies! So, if you don't, you're not ready for loud noises and stuff, if you're ready to go to sleep, this might be a bit disruptive. I apologize, but I wanted to do it. Alzora has our uh, has our raid message. It's stomp the babies, because <laughs> it's it's dead space. It's dead space. So tomorrow will be a regular stream. We'll start off with I'm gonna play prop hunt with some friends first. It'll be a collab to start, which means commands will be turned off. But then I will swap over back to Sekiro, and we will finish up with Sekiro for Saturday. Okay? Okay. Okay. Thanks for stopping by, boy. Watching my spooky story reading asmr stream thank you those who raided and came in with raids i hope you enjoyed <laughs> enjoyed my stay i'm glad i'm glad i hope regardless of what time zone you're in whether it's the morning or the afternoon or even the night that you have a good one and maybe maybe i'll make this another redeem again for the we won't necessarily have to. Maybe we could we could do like all SCPs if we wanted to. <laughs> it was fun to listen to. I'm glad. See you later. Be good raiders. Be good raiders. <laughs>